So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is uh, Oskar Johannesson, and uh, I have been giving, giving the role to uh, introduce uh, speakers. Uh, I will, uh, and first I, I will mention that we are running uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, late, so uh, the schedule is uh, a little bit late. Uh, I will not do the introduction all at, uh, all at once now, uh, as the original uh, schedule suggested, but right before the, the talk of, of each uh, speaker. Uh, I want to be begin with thanking the, the organizers of this uh, important uh, event. Uh, I congratulate uh, Antti and, uh, and Emma Kirschen, who has done an, an excellent uh, job. Although this is not a, a, a formally, uh, formally not a, a PFS uh, conference, it is uh, spiritually and intellectually closely connected with our uh, beloved Property and Freedom Society. In his most recent book, The Great Fiction, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe includes a very interesting article which was originally published in the Libertarian Standard. It is chapter 24 in the book, My Life on the Right. In it, Hoppe talks about his experience with intellectual societies prior to the property and freedom societies. He discusses the Monte Pelerin Society, which he was very critical of, and the John Randolph Club, which was far more to his liking. Hoppe mention, mentions that quite a few of his old John Randolph Club comrades have appeared in his PFF, PFS conferences in Bodrum including Paul Gottfried, Walter Bloch, David Gordon, Yuri Maltsev, Justin Raimondo, Tom Di Lorenzo, and Peter Brimelov, who is also a, a di distinct, distinguished speaker at this conference. Hoppe describes the club in the following way. The John Randolph Club was a coalition of two distinct groups of intellectuals. On the one hand was a group of anarcho-capitalists Austro-libertarians led by Rothbard, mostly of economists, but also philosophers, lawyers, historians, and sociologists. On the other hand was a group of writers associated with the conservative monthly chronicles, a magazine of American culture, and its editor, Tom Fleming. On the libertarian side, Hoppe explains, the cooperation with conservatives was motivated by the insight that while libertarianism may be logically compatible with many cultures, sociologically, it requires a conservative Bourgeau core culture. The decision to form an intellectual alliance with conservatives, according to Hoppe, involved for the libertarians a double break with establishment libertarianism, as re represented, for instance, by the Cato Institute. Then Hoppe says the following. This establishment libertarianism was not only theoretically in error <coughs> with its co commitment to the impossible goal of limited government and centralized government of that. It was also sociologically flawed with its anti burgo indeed adolescent so-called cosmopolitan cultural message of multiculturalism and egalitarianism, of respect, no authority, of live and let live, of hedonism and libertinism. The anti-establishment Austro-Libertarian sought, according to Hoppe, to learn more from the conservative side about the cultural requirements of a free and prosperous commonwealth. And by at large, they did learn their lessons, Hoppe claims. For the conservative side of the alliance, on the other hand, the cooperation with the austro Austrian anarcho-capitalists signified a complete break with the so-called neoconservative movement that had come to dominate organized conservatism in the United States. Then Hoppe says the following. The paleoconservatives, as they came to be known, opposed the neoconservative goal of highly and increasingly centralized, economically efficient 
welfare warfare state as incom incompatible with the traditional conservative core values of private property, of family and family households, and of local communities and their protection. The co cooperation with the libertarian anarchist was also to give the traditionalist conservatives the opportun opportunity to learn sound Austrian school economics. Next, Hoppe accounts for the unfortunate breakup of the John Randolph Club soon after Murray Rothbard passed away. It had a lot to do with the political campaign of uh, Pat Buchanan, as you can all read about in the chapter. In many ways, the Property and Freedom Society captured the spirit and goal behind the John Randolph Club. I fully agree with Hans Hermann Hoppe. I believe traditionalist conservatives of the right kind and Austrian school libertarians of the right kind have a lot to learn from each other. Furthermore, I believe that they form a natural alliance against the neoconservatives and the neoliberals who have poisoned the mainstream right-wing agenda for a long time. Ron Paul did an amazing job appealing to both groups. And one could argue that he belongs to both groups, as many people do. There is no contradiction in such a standpoint, as there is no contradiction in being against the modern, mass democratic managerial state on the one hand, and sharing the social and cultural agenda of, for example, Roger Scruton on the other hand. In fact, such views are in total harmony. Combined, they form a fully coherent ideology. I hope this conference will contribute to such alliance and such philosophy. It's now time to turn to the first speaker. Um, now, it is my honor to introduce our first distinguished speaker, uh, James G. Uh, Rickards, uh, the famous author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, which was published in, in 2011. He argues that the Federal Reserve is by its practices involved in what he calls the greatest gamble in the history of finance. Jim Rickards is an American economist, uh, lawyer and investment banker with decades of experience in capital markets, a graduate of uh, Johns Hopkins, Penn and NYU. He's a well-known commentator and advisor on finance and is uh, notorious for his good insights and superior predictive ability. He is an op-ed contributor to uh, the Financial Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. He has been interviewed in the Wall Street uh, Journal and appeared on channels such as CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, CNN, and BBC. Uh, I could go on for a long time introducing uh, this speaker there's a lot to say, but time will pre prevent me from, from doing so. Still, in the, in the end, I want to mention his forthcoming book, The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System, which we'll, of course, we will, of course, all buy. The name of his talk is uh, Culture, Complexity, and Capital Markets. Please welcome Jim Rickards. Oscar, th thank you uh, for that uh, very kind introduction, and it's a, a pleasure uh, to be here today. I particularly want to thank uh, Andy and Emma uh, Curzon for, uh, for reaching out and uh, organizing this wonderful event, a great venue. Until, uh, uh, until about 9 o'clock last night, I would have been thanking Andy because he was my point of contact, but then I met Emma last night and realized she was uh, a co-equal partner, a big part of this, so I thank them both. And I also think it's great that we're in this very open, airy uh, venue. This is an Intellectual Minds conference, and we want to, uh, obviously, the goal is to encourage uh, openness of thought and discussion. So uh, rather than being some kind of cramped hotel ballroom, this is a, a great venue. So really, uh, really a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, we're going to go through this. I'll leave a little time for questions at the end. But in the interest of time, if we don't have as many questions as everyone would like, I'm going to be here the rest of the day and for dinner and uh, I think for breakfast tomorrow. So I'm always happy to 
get questions over the course of the day. I'm sure we'll have some coffee breaks and, and uh, sort of networking opportunities and all that. So I'm very, uh, very open, uh, open to that. Um, I want to do uh, a couple different things. Uh, we're going to do some science, we're going to do some economics, and then we're going to do a little um, sort of look over the horizon uh, what will happen uh, to the international monetary system. Um, and uh, it's the, the title, Culture, Complexity, and Capital Markets. The capital markets part is easy. Hopefully, the, uh, we all understand that. Hopefully, the complexity part uh, we'll, we'll get through, and that will be very clear. The culture part is a little more amorphous, but of course, any system, uh, economic, political, uh, religious, um, you know, et cetera, operates within the broader culture. So I want to really start with that, because I think it conditions uh, what we understand about capital markets and, uh, and how they operate, and, and start with um, something called the, the paradigm shift. Now, I abhor cliches. I try really, really hard to avoid them and not use them. I find they're often a, a shortcut for, uh, for thought, and you hear things like kicking the can down the road and so forth. But, but paradigm shift, uh, the phrase paradigm shift, does get used as a cliche, and a lot of people throw it around and maybe don't know the whole meaning or history of it. But uh, to me, it's not a cliche. It's a very profound uh, concept. And uh, I mean, it's been around forever as, as, a, as a construct. But in terms of formalizing a definition of it, this really comes from uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn in his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he made the point um, that most people assume that science advances in small, easy steps. Uh, we all understand the scientific method involves experimentation. Uh, you have a theory, you do experiments, you test empirical results against the theory. Uh, if it fits, you keep going. If it doesn't fit, you're supposed to discard the theory. Uh, but it can take a long time to accumulate that evidence. Uh, and then new insights arise, et cetera. So this is a, the scientific method. We all understand it. And it was assumed that this is a process that just moves along in a gradual progression. And science gets better, and we get smarter, and, uh, uh, and it's sort of all good. And Q made the point that that's absolutely not true. Uh, it can be true for certain periods of time, but the way science really advances is through very disruptive, radical changes in the way we think about everything. That there are certain points where, um, you know, it, it can be genius, but it can also be, be sort of applied genius in the sense of uh, out of the box thinking, um, interdisciplinary approaches, various ways. And certain people come along at certain times and they overthrow the old way of thinking about things and they introduce a new way. And over time, that becomes adopted. That the Kuhn's point is that, and that's what he meant by the paradigm shift. The paradigm is not a model, and it's not a theory, and it's not a data point. It's something bigger than that. It's, a, it's just a way that we think about everything in whatever area. It could be cosmology, it could be economics, it could be um, engineering, it could be a lot of things. But it's the way we condition our thought, and then we operate within that paradigm. So the idea of the paradigm shift were these periodic revolutions, if you will, in thought. And he said that's the way science really advances. But he made another point, uh, which we'll spend a lot of time on, which is that the idea may emerge suddenly, and it may emerge in a very disruptive way. But that does not mean it's adopted immediately by the practitioners and by the academic community and others. The idea can come up very suddenly, but the process by which it becomes the new paradigm can go on for 50 or 100 years. And it's a very frustrating process. If you happen to be one of the, I'll use the phrase, early adopt, adopters, if you happen to be one of the people involved in the scientific re revolution who kind of get it, um, but you're dealing with an establishment that doesn't get it, that's wedded to the old paradigm, that's a very frustrating place to be. Now, eventually, good science prevails. The new idea becomes the new paradigm, and it'll get overthrown at some point in the future. But So, so think of it as these sudden uh, bursts of uh, ideas. Uh, but followed by perhaps a long, slow, and even frustrating period of adoption by the broader community. So that was, that was Kuhn's contribution to uh, understanding the history of science. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, there are many, many examples, but this is my favorite, one that, that uh, a lot of people uh, are, are familiar with, is uh, cosmology and the understanding of, of the universe, really. And for 1,500 years, from approximately the first century AD, uh, to the early 16th century AD, so a very long period of time. Uh, cosmology was basically variations on um, uh, Claudius Ptolemy and his ideas. And the idea was, you know, just in a nutshell, he wrote a book and that, that was, that was uh, preserved uh, through a lot of disruption in the fall of the Roman Empire and so forth. But the idea was uh, this was the geocentric 
cosmos. So the idea was that the Earth was the center of the universe uh, and that the planets and the sun revolved around the Earth in spheres. Um, and outside these spheres was a larger sphere of the stars and the cosmos. And this was uh, very obviously true because uh, you know, you're on the Earth and you wake up in the morning and the sun's over there and it goes, over, goes down there and it comes back up over there. Same thing with the planets. So it was, it was perfectly obvious that, that this was true, that the Earth was the center of the universe and planets and stars revolved around the Earth. Um, and he had it that they were in these um, concentric circles, these orbs as they were called. And this was the prevailing view and it was the, the subject of a lot of science, a lot of math, a lot of calculation over, as I say, this, this 1500 year period. Um, there was one, uh, one small problem with this, which is as uh, observation improved, as telescopes improved, uh, people began to notice that some of these stars and planets were not exactly where they were supposed to be. And, and here uh, you see this, these big circles where you just see part of the arc. Let's call that the, um, the arc of uh, the revolution of um, uh, Venus around the, around the Earth, because the Earth is the center of the universe. Uh, but they began to observe that uh, the planets were sort of here. They were supposed to be on this arc, or maybe the green one is another example, but they were actually observed here or here. They were somewhat off the arc. Uh, here's another example. Here's the, uh, the, uh, the green circle is the revolution of Mercury around the Earth, but every now and then Mercury would be out here instead of there. So um, there are a couple reactions to this. One is, you know, maybe our theory is wrong. Maybe this whole thing that Ptolemy laid out 1,500 years ago is wrong. But the scientists of the day said, well, no, we know he's right, uh, but we need an explanation for this data that doesn't quite fit. So they began to develop the idea of the, uh, this, this, this green circle is the cycle, so they developed the idea of the epicycle. They said, well, yes, it's a big cycle around the Earth, but every now and then there are these little circles called epicycles on the bigger circles, and they began to calculate them, and here you see some scientific calculations. Here's the uh, epicycle of Mars on the larger cycle. Uh, here, here, here are other illustrations, and they kind of do these curly cues and loop-de-loops, and they, they began to work out the math. Uh, and uh, as they got more observations, they did more calculations and more epicycles and more complication, loaded and loaded on top of each other to explain what they were observing within this paradigm that the Earth was the center of the universe. Uh, and it all got very complicated, but the point is they were not dumb people. They were as smart as we are, they were as smart as any scientist who ever lived. The math was good, the math was not primitive, uh, but they worked very, very hard to take these empirical observations that seemed at odds with the paradigm and fit them into the paradigm by embellishing the paradigm and adding these epicycles. Um, along comes our friend Copernicus, and he said, along with others, said, well, you know, what if the Earth is not the center of the universe? What if the Sun is the center, if not of the universe, at least of the solar system or the cosmos as we observe it, and the planets uh, revolve around the Sun? And furthermore, what if these orbits are not circular, they're not orbs or spheres, but they're actually elliptical? Um, and, and he published a paper on this, and others, Tycho Brahe and uh, uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, added empirical observations. And they said, you know what? That theory works. In other words, it explains all these observations. These observations that seem to be at odds with the geocentric universe were perfectly consistent with the heliocentric universe. So it was not necessary to add epicycles onto cycles and continue to embellish it. You actually didn't have to do anything. If you just observed the data, it fit perfectly with this paradigm of a heliocentric cosmos with elliptical orbits. And certainly, of course, that is the way it really is. But it took 1,500 years to, to get there. Uh, but more to the point, to Kuhn's point, it took 100 years for this new paradigm to prevail. So you would think, well, gee, I could just explain to you, you know, the Earth's not the center of the cosmos, the Sun is, and if you look at it, you know, they have these elliptical orbits, you know, you get into gravity a little bit, and, and it, it fits the data. You don't have to embellish it, it actually is a perfect fit. You would think that that idea could be grasped very quickly, but it wasn't. Uh, it took, as I said, it took 100 years, really the course of the 16th century, well into the 17th century before this became the Randy paradigm. So this is a classic case. Uh, you know, you can use right or wrong, but I don't think that's the, the, the right way to uh, characterize it, because what it really is is science advancing in the way Kuhn described by these periodic disruptions. So Copernicus uh, and, and Brahe and, and Kepler were the disruptors 
Uh, they overthrew the Ptolemaic paradigm that had prevailed for 1,500 years. They introduced a new paradigm that is still with us today. Uh, but, but the point is, when you're defending the old paradigm, uh, the problem is you, you do get defensive. You, you, the tendency is to take data that doesn't fit and try to explain it away within the context of the old paradigm rather than saying, you know what, maybe my idea is wrong, maybe there's another, another idea out there. So I want to leave this little kind of history of science lesson with you. We'll return to it in the capital markets context uh, to explain what's going on in finance today. But now what I want to do is digress a little bit into more straight up economics uh, and then come back to this idea of the paradigm shift as applied to uh, capital markets. Um, one of my um, uh, favorite authors, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, remarked in the, uh, one of his um, essays, uh, he said, the, uh, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Uh, and I put a lot of emphasis on that last phrase. A lot of people get two ideas in their head, but they sort of break down at that point. But if you have two uh, completely opposite ideas, but you can still process that and function, that that's really what um, high intelligence demands in a, in a complicated world. And this is very important to understand what's going on in economics today and what's going on in capital markets today. Because there are two opposed ideas that are both in existence, both powerful, that are completely opposite, but if you can't entertain them both, you're going to, I think, not quite grasp what is going on with central banking, what is going on in economics. And these two ideas are inflation and deflation. Uh, we tend to be binary about this. We say, well, we're in an inflationary period, or less frequently, we're in a deflationary period. We have one or the other. And in fact, if you look at the data, the time series of um, price indices, CPI, PPI, what's called PCE, price deflator, which is a favorite of the Fed. These indices are, are what economists call well-behaved. They're running about 1%, which sounds pretty good. You know, they, if central banks are supposed to give you price stability, 1% uh, means you don't have a lot of inflation, you don't have a lot of deflation. Uh, it seems like they're doing their job. The problem is that that 1% is really the net of two very powerful forces deflation and inflation coexisting, pushing against each other and netting out to one. And the reason that's important is because that's an unstable relationship. If you had a stable 1%, that would be one thing. That might even be desirable. But if you have an unstable 1%, which is the net of two offsetting forces, that's a lot more dangerous because the risk is that it could break one way or the other. Uh, and the uh, easiest way to understand that is just think of plate tectonics. Uh, on seismology, um, I've been out to California and stood on the San Andreas Fault, and you can actually see the San Andreas Fault because well, part of it runs through the desert, and because of the fault line, the water sort of percolates up to the top, and there's a, you'll see a green strip uh, running in the middle of the desert because of the water coming up. That's the San Andreas Fault, and you can stand on it. And the day I stood on it, it wasn't moving. It was perfectly still, and I could say, well, it's all good, but we know it's not all good. We know that underneath, these powerful plates, these continental uh, and oceanic plates are pushing against each other, building up pressure, and we know it's only a matter of time before that breaks. And in, a, in the worst catastrophe, you know, half of Los Angeles could fall into the sea. So it's not a stable relationship, even though it was perfectly calm the day I happened to be standing there. That's the way to understand these inflationary and deflationary forces. Now, where do they come from? Deflation is what I call the natural consequence of a depression. And um, we're in a depression now. Uh, you have to be 90 years old to have a living memory of the last global depression. Uh, very few people sort of qualify in that category. But for those who wonder, gee, what is a what's a depression like? What's it like to live in a depression? This is it. It feels like this. Um, I give uh, presentations um, like this all over the world. And what's interesting is, uh, uh, you get to hear the questions and get to hear what's on people's mind. And it's, uh, it's particularly interesting when you hear the same thing on five continents. And one of the main questions I get is people come up and they say, you know, Jim, I understand bull markets, I understand bear markets, I understand business cycles, I understand credit cycles. I get all that. I don't understand this. This feels different, what we're going through right now. And my answer is, you're right. It is different. It's something the world hasn't gone through for, for 80 years, and maybe even uh, had to go further back to find the exact parallel. So we're, we're, in a, we're in a depression. A lot of people don't know what a depression is. They assume that a depression 
is a continuous period of declining GDP. That is not the definition of a depression. That's part of the technical definition of a recession. At least in the U.S., we define as two quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment and a few other bells and whistles. That's the technical definition of a recession. A depression is different. A depression is a prolonged period of below trend growth or below capacity growth or below potential growth. So a simple example, if, you're, if your economy is potential uh, is 3 or 4 percent and you're actually growing at 1 or 2 percent, that's a depression. It doesn't have to be going down all the time. It's just going up less than it's capable of. And that gap between the 3 or 4 percent on the one hand and the, the 1 or 2 actual growth, that gap keeps getting bigger. It's a wedge that keeps getting bigger. That represents lost wealth, lost output, and you never get it back. The best you can do is get back to trend and close the gap on a going forward basis, but you never recover that lost wealth, and the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. That's what we're in today. We're in, we've been in that since 2007. Now, deflation is the natural product of a depression. Uh, people are in distress. Uh, they want to reduce their balance sheet, so they sell assets, they get cash, they take the cash, they pay down debt, so they're, they're deleveraging. Well, what happens when you sell assets? It tends to depress the price. That puts the next guy in distress. He's got to sell assets. He's got to do the same thing. Well, the whole world is doing this. This is a liquidity trap. It feeds on itself. There's demand for cash, and you're deleveraging, and that tends to drive prices down. So that's the natural state of the world. Offsetting that is inflation caused by policy. And the policy is money printing by all the major central banks, by the Federal Reserve, first and foremost, but also the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, ECB to a lesser extent. But you look around the world, all the central banks are printing money like crazy. Normally, that is absent a depression. That kind of money printing would have led very quickly to inflation. But in fact, we haven't seen that much inflation, but the money is, has been piling up, and it represents sort of potential or latent deflation, uh, inflation, sorry. I'll come back to that. So, so here you have what's called the natural deflation coming out of a depression and the policy-induced inflation coming from the money printing. They're, they're fighting each other to a standstill. The data says that prices are well behaved, but the reality is you've got these two powerful forces underneath exactly like the tectonic plate. So that's, those are the two big ideas. Get those in your head, sort of you know, keep them both there and uh, without saying which, way, which one is going to prevail, understand that we're in an unstable uh, situation. So let's just jump over to uh, monetary policy and, and kind of apply some of what we just talked about. Here's our, um, let me get that. Here's our old friend, uh, the quantity theory of money. You all learned this in your first week of, uh, of economics. And it's, it's you call it an equation, but it's really an identity or definition. It's very simple. M is money supply. Uh, v is velocity. Velocity is the turnover of money. How quickly is the money turning over? So uh, let's say I go to the, the bar tonight and I leave a tip for the bartender and the bartender takes the taxi home and pays the taxi driver and the taxi driver takes the fare and puts gas in his tank. Well that, that dollar, that pound has velocity of three. You know, One pound supported three pounds of goods and services, the tip, the taxi, and the gasoline. But if I stay home and watch television and don't go out, my money has velocity of zero. So velocity is just a fancy word for the turnover of money. So how much money is there and how quickly is it turning over? Multiply those two together and that gives you PQ. PQ is the nominal value of all the goods and services in the economy. It's just nominal GDP. It's, it's common sense. Well, how much money is there? How fast is it turning over? That's the economy in nominal terms. But it has, nominal GDP has two subcomponents. One is the real GDP. The other one is a price index, which can be inflation or deflation. So nominal GDP is just real GDP multiplied by a price index. And that together, nominal GDP equals money supply times velocity. So this is, again, a basic identity. It's a way of conducting thought experiments. So Milton Friedman, who was the major proponent of this in the 20th century, looked at this and said, well, in terms of policy, this is really a trivial exercise. Uh, because we know the Q can only be about 3 to 4 percent. In a mature economy like the United States, um, Q can only be about 3 or 4 percent because real productivity can, is only the sum of labor force times productivity. So real output is labor force times productivity. How many people are working? How productive are they? That's all there is. And I'll again use the United States as an example. Our population grows about 1, 1.5 percent a year. 
productivity typically grows maybe two, two and a half percent per year. You add them up, you get a number somewhere between three and four percent, and that's it. Now, if, if for short periods of time, it can be higher or lower. It's lower in a recession. It can be higher coming out of a recession when there's a lot of unemployed people. Labor force participation can increase faster, but once the last unemployed person gets a job, then that's it, you're back to population growth. So the central tendency is sort of three to four percent. And Friedman said, we know that we want P to be one. One means no inflation or deflation. So any number times one is itself. So P, P is one, that means nominal GDP equals real GDP. That means no inflation, no deflation. That's a good state of the world. And Friedman assumed that velocity was constant. So he said, well, this is easy. If this can only grow three to 4%, and we want this to be one, and this is constant, all we have to do is increase the money supply three to 4% a year, and voila, we get maximum real growth with no inflation. And Friedman used to joke, we don't need a Federal Reserve or an open market committee. All we need is a computer to crank out that much money, and we'll have this central bank nirvana of maximum real growth and no inflation. Now, of course, there's more to it than that. There are leads and lags, and as, as I just explained, sometimes the economy can grow a little faster, sometimes slower. But that was the basic idea uh, behind Friedman's monetarism, and this is very powerful uh, influence on monetary policy today. So that's the theory. So let's, let's sort of test it out in the real world. What's going on with money supply? Well, here you see from 1980 to about 2008, the money supply grows at a nice steady rate, exactly as Friedman prescribed. This is what Friedman would have liked to see, this nice, slow, steady growth in the money supply to accommodate normal growth in the economy without high inflation. Uh, but all of a sudden, we have this, uh, this uh, parabolic or this kind of Roman candle going vertical. This is QE1, where the Fed took the money supply from 800 billion, doubled it to about 1.6 trillion. Uh, then, it, then they ended QE1, it kind of went sideways a little bit, in November of 2010, they introduced QE2, QE quantitative easing. It's just a fancy name for money printing. Uh, and then uh, QE2 goes like that. So that's your second vertical. In June 2011, they ended QE2. And so money supply kind of goes sideways a little bit. By the way, when they did that, the stock market went down and the economy lost steam. Uh, and so they launched QE3. And I do try to update these charts, but I have to tell you, this one's a little bit behind. The actual money supply is up here. Uh, if, I, if I come back next year, I'm going to need a scissor lift to sort of, <laughs> it'll be up here. But it, it's now past, um, it's approaching $4 trillion. And the Fed is printing money at the rate of a trillion dollars a year, about $85 billion per month times 12. It's a trillion dollars a year. So without so-called tapering, it'll go to $4 trillion, $5 trillion, $6 trillion. They will taper uh, in 2014, by the way. I don't think they could do it next week. My view is they won't, but it kind of doesn't matter because whether it's February or March, it'll be soon enough, and they're going to have to taper. But for now, they've taken the money supply, um, you know, again, up to, up to uh, approaching $4 trillion. Well, so wait a second. Uh, Friedman said, you know, you should, you should grow this about 4% a year. Here we've grown it 400% uh, in four years. Why don't we have 3% uh, real growth and 397% inflation? Uh, well, the answer is that Friedman was wrong, that uh, velocity is not constant. Velocity is actually collapsing. Um, people are hoarding money, staying home. In my example, they're not going to the bar and tipping the bartender. They're staying home and watching TV. By the way, this hasn't happened since the Great Depression. There's a little bit of volatility in here, but if, you, if I had a longer time series, you'd see that velocity is relatively constant. From 1950 to 1980, uh, velocity actually was constant. Uh, so Friedman, during his working career, was correct. He assumed velocity was constant. That's what he observed. Well, for 30 years, it was constant. So he, it's not like he made it up. But the problem is it turns out to be extremely volatile. So you can understand monetary policy as a desperate race between increasing money supply and decreasing velocity. Uh, and I like to remind people that $3 trillion times zero is zero. In other words, if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So what's happening is velocity is imploding. If you held money supply constant, the, the nominal GDP would be collapsing. You've got to increase money supply to offset the velocity. So this is the answer to this. Now, this is temporary. This is not sustainable because there will come a time when, as I say, you print five trillion, six trillion, you risk losing, you risk collapsing confidence in the US dollar itself. 
And the Fed knows this. There are all kinds of other technical bad effects from this. They're trying to gloss it over. There's a real debate in the Federal Open Market Committee between those who think you can keep printing, that there's sort of no limit on that, led by Janet Yellen, and those who see serious hidden consequences, uh, led by Jeremy Stein. It's a highly technical debate, but suffice to say that even the Fed doesn't think that they can print forever. So what they've really got to do, printing is a temporary solution, what they've really got to do is bend this curve. They've got to get that velocity curve going back up again. Because if, you, if you're the printing money to offset the decline, but there's a limit on how much they can print, they've got to turn that curve and get it up. Velocity is psychological, it's behavioral. Money is mechanical. The Fed can really print as much as they want or reduce the money supply. They can control the money supply, uh, trust me, they can make it whatever they want. But they can't control your behavior, or at least not directly. Uh, but that's what they have to do. They've got to get us away from the TV set, back into the restaurant, taking our friends to dinner and drinks you know, for everyone at the bar. Um, so that's a propaganda exercise. The Fed has got to engage in propaganda, in effect lie to us to change our behavior, because if we don't feel like spending money, that curve's not going to bend and the economy's in serious trouble. Um, so I, I like to keep my equations simple, by the way, so I can understand them. Um, <laughs> This is, uh, so I've got 1 plus 3 equals 4, and 3 plus 1 equals 4. Take the first term <coughs> to be inflation. Take the second term to be real growth, and add them together, you get nominal growth. The first equation is central bank nirvana, right? That's 1% inflation, which is pretty good, 3% real growth, which is close to maximum, 4% nominal growth, which if your deficit is less than 4% of GDP, you're actually on a very sustainable path in terms of debt and deficits. But the, the Fed has to get to 4. They have to get to 4% nominal growth. And what they're saying is, well, the reason they have to get to 4% nominal growth is because debt is nominal. Uh, if I borrow a dollar from you, I owe you a dollar. It's interesting whether in real terms it's worth a dollar five or 95 cents when I get around to paying you back. But in fact, it's a nominal contract. I owe you a dollar. So given the debt and deficits around the world, you need nominal growth to pay nominal debt. Uh, real growth isn't enough. It has to be nominal growth. The Fed has to get to four. They would like this, but they'll take this. What they're signaling, what they're telling you is that if we can't get one plus three, we'll take three plus one. We'll take 3% inflation and 1% real growth because you have to get to four. So this is, th this, is what, this is kind of a way to understand central bank policy, what the problem is. The problem is bending the velocity curve, um, and the problem, and the goal is to get nominal GDP. They would like to get a big slug of real GDP and the nominal GDP, but they'll take inflation if, that, if that's what it takes because they've got to pay the debt. So now um, the question is, uh, how does the Fed bend the velocity curve? I, I said that that was a, a psychological problem or a behavioral problem. Well, there are two main ways of doing that. One is uh, to create a situation called negative real rates. Negative real rates is simply the world where the rate of inflation is higher than the nominal rate. So a simple example, let's just use a 10-year Treasury note as a benchmark. If the 10-year if the Treasury is 2.5% and inflation is 3.5%, your real rate is negative 100 basis points, negative 1%. That is a very powerful inducement to borrow. That's better than free money. If I'm a banker and I charge you zero, that sounds pretty good. But with negative real rates, the bank is paying you to be a borrower because you get to pay them back in cheaper dollars. So in real terms, in a world of negative rates, the bank is paying you to be a borrower. A very powerful inducement to borrow. The second thing the Fed is trying to do is create an inflationary shock. Um, so you hear the Fed uh, talk, and by the way, I'm saying the Fed, that's my home turf, but everything I'm saying you can apply to the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England. Mark Carney's saying the same thing. All the central bankers say they have a 2% inflation goal. Um, 2%, 2%, 2% ad nauseum. Well, here's the problem. If I promise you 2% and I give you 2%, there's no change in behavior. I've exactly met your expectations, so there's nothing there that changes your behavior. What I have to do is lie to you. I have to promise you 2% and give you 3%, and that's a shock. Now you're like, oh, gee, inflation's out of control. Better buy a house, buy a car, et cetera. So this combination of getting inflation up to the 3 3 3.5% range does two things. You keep a lid on nominal rates. By the way, just to digress for a second, people say, well, wait a second. If inflation were 3, 3.5%, wouldn't the yield on the 10-year note go to 4% or 4.5% because bond traders aren't dopes? And the answer is, 
In a non-manipulated market, yes, but we have manipulated markets, and the Fed will use what's called financial repression to keep a lid. So in a normal market with higher inflation, the, the yield on the 10-year note would, would go up just as much or more, but the Fed is going to use financial repression to keep a lid on nominal rates. They're going to use policy to, to create inflation, get inflation above nominal rates, get negative real rates, and that's your inducement to borrow, that's your inducement to spend, deliver an inflationary shock, and change behavior and get nominal GDP going. So the Fed's, the Fed's idea is um, let's use these two tools, get the lending and spending machine going again, get people borrowing, feeling good, spending money, get nominal GDP increasing, get nominal GDP back to trend, make it self-sustaining, gradually withdraw policy, substitute real GDP, uh, real GDP for nominal GDP, get real GDP back to trend, and we all live happily ever after. Uh, that's what the Fed is trying to do. They will fail, I'll explain why they're going to fail, but it's important to know what they think they're doing and what, what they're trying to do uh, as a way of understanding monetary policy. So um, let me uh, illustrate why, I just, I just asserted what they're doing, and there's a lot of evidence to support that, but let me sort of prove to you why the Fed must have inflation. Uh, because what you're looking at, this, this is also a simple equation, uh, I think we just moved from fifth grade math to seventh grade math maybe, as um, uh, the Fed's worst nightmare, which is you can have a world, when you have deflation, you actually go through the looking glass. You're in the world of negative inflation. Now the conventional uh, uh, formula is you take nominal growth, subtract inflation, and that gives you real growth. And the way this is usually expressed is, let's say we have 5% nominal growth and 2% inflation. So 5 minus 2 is 3. So that gives you 3% real growth, which is pretty good. 3% real growth is good. So you usually see this formula, 5 minus 2 equals 3. But imagine a world where nominal growth is going down. The, the, the absolute value of goods and services is going down. So let's call that negative 1. But deflation has taken over. So now inflation is a negative. And when you subtract inflation, you're subtracting a negative, which means you add the absolute value. So let's say deflation is 3%, which is negative 3% inflation. So now you have minus 1 minus negative 3 equals plus 2. 2% real growth is not bad. Uh, it's a little below potential, but it's not bad. But, but look at what's going on with nominal growth. So here you have a world where deflation takes over. You have a world where you can have positive real growth, but nominal growth is declining. But remember what I said about debt. You need nominal growth to pay nominal debt. If you have negative nominal growth, you can't pay your debts. You will have a sovereign bond crisis. You will default on your debts. There are other problems associated with negative nominal growth, which is your tax system collapses. Again, I'll give a very simple example. Let's say you make um, 100,000 pounds, and your boss gives you a 10% raise. Now, let's assume prices are stable. So now you're making 110,000 pounds, and you go, well, that's good. I've just had a 10% increase in my standard of living because I got stable prices and I got a 10% raise. Aha, but the government comes along and taxes roughly half of that. So you're really only 5% better off, not 10% better off, because the government took half in taxes. Now imagine a different world where you're making 100,000 pounds, you don't get a raise, you have no nominal increase, but prices decline 10%. You've had the same 10% increase in your standard of living. You don't make any more money, but if the price of everything you buy goes down 10%, you're 10% richer in terms of your standard of living. But the government can't tax it. They can't tax that gain. So there's an asymmetry between the government's ability to tax a nominal increase in your standard of living and the government's inability to tax a real increase resulting from deflation because there's nothing to tax. So for all these reasons, the impact on debt to GDP, the impact on tax revenues, et cetera, deflation is a central bank's worst nightmare. They have to avoid it at all costs. Therefore, they must have inflation. Therefore, they've got to get velocity going. Therefore, they have to engage in these sort of psychological games that I just described. So this is what the Fed is trying to do. This is why they're trying to do it. Uh, as I said, this is going on all over the world. So all right, so I posit that the Fed's got to get the 3% inflation. They have to do it for the reasons I described, which is you want negative real rates and inflationary shock. You've got to avoid deflation for the reasons I described, which is that you can't tax the real gains and, you're, and you end up defaulting on your debt. How exactly does the Fed go about getting 3% inflation? Well, they've been trying pretty hard. Uh, going back to 2007, first they started cutting interest rates. Uh, then beginning in 2008, they've engaged in quantitative easing. 
Uh, also in 2008, they engaged in communications policy, what they call forward guidance. I call it propaganda. A um, good friend of mine is, uh, works for the chairman of the Fed. He's, he's in charge of communications policy. He's, I call him the minister of propaganda when I, when I meet him. He doesn't like that, but that's what he is. Um, uh, 2010, they started the currency wars. And the, the easiest way to understand currency wars, when you cut rates to zero and you want to ease monetary policy, uh, and Lars Svensson is deputy governor of the Bank of Sweden, former colleague in the economics department of Princeton, a former colleague of Ben Bernanke, uh, had a paper in 2002, and he said, you're not out of bullets. When you're at the zero bound, you can still ease by cutting your exchange rate. And this is the beginning of the currency wars. And a lot of people assume, gee, countries cheapen their currency to promote exports. That's not why they do it. Uh, there might be a little pickup, although that's, that's largely a myth. The reason countries are cheapening their currency is to not to promote exports, but to import inflation. Uh, because the U.S. is a net import. You, you cheapen the dollar, maybe you help Boeing sell a few aircraft relative to Airbus, but what you're really doing is increasing the cost of everything Americans buy, textiles, manufactured goods, electronics, et cetera. In the case of Japan, it would be energy. So countries are fighting the currency wars to import inflation or, in effect, export their own deflation to their trading partners. That is a very destructive process. 2011, we had Operation Twist. Uh, 2012, uh, just about a year ago this week, uh, they announced, in effect, nominal GDP targeting. They said we won't ease until uh, we get to 6.5% unemployment and 2.5% uh, inflation. Uh, importantly, those were not triggers. Those were thresholds. They said we won't ease. They didn't say we'll ease when we get to those levels. They said we won't ease until we get to those levels, but we could go past them, and I think that is what we should expect. Um, and if there's any surprise in 2014, since all these other things have failed, uh, there'll be what they call helicopter money. You've all heard the expression, you know, the Fed throwing, printing money and throwing out of helicopters. Um, they won't literally do that, but the way you do it is with tax cuts. One of the problems today is that the, mo the money printing isn't doing any good because it's just building up in bank reserves. The banks are not lending it out, so you're not getting, you're getting the money printing on the front end but you're not getting the velocity on the back end. Uh, it's, people say, gee, how could you print $4 trillion and not have inflation? Well, the answer is, if you want a ham and cheese sandwich, you need ham and cheese. Money printing is the ham, velocity is the cheese. We're missing the velocity. So what helicopter money is, is basically cut the bank out of the equation and put money right in people's pockets. And the way you do that is with fiscal policy, with a tax cut, because if I tax if I cut your taxes, you have more money in your pocket. You don't need a bank to lend it to you. Uh, that will also fail because you can put the money in people's pockets, but they won't spend it. They'll pay down debt because we're still in this deleveraging mode. But the Fed thinks it'll work. So anyway, so this is the problem. This is the dynamic. This is what the Fed is doing. This is how you should understand monetary policy. Uh, and then I asked the question, what could go wrong? Um, now back to uh, Ptolemy and Copernicus. Everything the Fed uh, thinks they understand about, mon about equilibrium and their economic models is pretty much completely wrong. They're operating on the wrong paradigm. Now, I know a lot of these guys and, and women, they're not dumb. They, they're a lot smarter than I am. Uh, you know, Larry Summers is, like, is at least, i uh, met him a few times, he's at least twice as smart as I am. Uh, they're really smart. They're, they're well-meaning, but they've got the wrong paradigm. And if you've got the wrong paradigm, you will get the wrong results every single time. And people who go back and tweak their models are wasting their time because you're, you're correctly modeling the wrong paradigm. You always get the wrong results. So it's sort of the, the dynamic versus the static uh, and getting the, getting the model right. So what the Fed does, the Fed looks at that automobile and they go, um, there's nothing wrong with that car. You know, it's shiny, full tank of gas, four good tires, good engine. They, they, that car is all good. There's not one thing wrong with it. But if you apply a dynamic approach, we all know what's going to happen next, which is going to fall down, crash, explode, and kill a bunch of people. So uh, this is the difference between the way the Fed thinks about the world and the way the world actually works. Uh, another uh, metaphor, we call these metaphors, but they're really not. They're really, the science is the same. The Fed is operating in a linear, reversible world. They think they're playing with a thermostat. So if the room is too warm, you dial it down a little bit. If the room is too hot, you dial it up a little bit. Uh, sorry, dial it, if it's too hot, you dial it down. If it's too cold, you dial it up. Uh, as I say, it's linear and reversible. In reality, 
the Fed is playing with a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor is an example of a complex dynamic system. Now, you can dial a nuclear reactor up or down, but you better get it right, because if you don't, you'll cause a catastrophic meltdown. You'll cause a catastrophe of the kind we saw in Japan in 2011, and it's not reversible. There's no such thing as a melt up. And so the, the Fed is moving the thermostat around, thinks they're working a thermostat, actually playing with a nuclear reactor, risking a catastrophic collapse of the economic system. And here's an illustration of the old and the new paradigm. Now what we have here are two uh, degree, what are called degree distributions. It's, you know, it's just a graph, it's, it's a y-axis and x-axis. In both of these examples, the y-axis represents the frequency of the event. How often does it happen? The x-axis represents the severity of the event. How extreme is the event? Now what these curves show us is kind of what you would expect, which is that extreme events out here happen very infrequently, close to zero on the y-axis. And that less extreme events, sort of down here on the x-axis, happen all the time with a high degree of frequency. So this, this, the small events happen a lot, and the extreme events happen rarely or infrequently. So that's what we would expect. Um, but what is the exact shape of the curve? What, is the, what does the data tell us about what's actually happening? Well, for over 50 years, uh, finance has basically used this bell curve. It's a bell curve, obviously shaped like a bell. It's also called a normal distribution. It's also called a Gaussian distribution. It has a couple of different names. But they've assumed that events, when I say events, I'm talking about um, volatility in the stock market, uh, financial meltdowns. Uh, does, you know, it's not so much will the stock market be up or down tomorrow. It's more about uh, which, whichever way it goes. Will it be a 1% move or a 2% move or a one quarter of 1% move, et cetera. Uh, that's what we mean by, by volatility. And they assume that this is normally distributed. Now the significance of the normal distribution, they say most of the days are right in here, the, the area under that part of the curve is large. But look out here. This is uh, six standard deviations. A standard deviation is just a measure of uh, how extreme the move is. What the bell curve tells us is that six standard deviations Notice we're touching the x-axis. It says, uh, sorry, we're, we're, we're at the bottom. Well, at this point of the x-axis, we're, we're intersecting zero on the y-axis. It tells us that this never happens. Not quite never. If you put it under a microscope, you'd find something. But basically, when the curve gets down here, you, you intersect the y-axis at, at zero. It's telling you that the thing never happens. Um, the problem is, they do happen. The, the observations are up here. In other words, if you take this and intersect the y-axis, you have a greater frequency than zero. There's zero. So the bell curve is telling you they never happen, but experience is telling us that they do happen with some frequency. What do I mean by happen? Well, um, 1987, the stock market collapsed 22% in a single day. 1929, it collapsed 24% over a two-day period. Uh, 1998, the dot-com collapse, where the NASDAQ fell from 5,000. What happened in 2008? Now, if you do these, if you use statistical methodology using the bell curve, you, when you say six standard deviations, some of these things are 15 standard deviations. What that means is that it should occur once since the beginning of the universe. And when I hear Quants at Goldman Sachs say, you know, we just had a, a 13 standard deviation event, I say, gee, you're really unlucky. You know, it was a really bad day for you because that's like once since the beginning of the universe. How, <laughs> how unlucky is that? And, but what it, what it tells me is that these observations here are exactly like looking at the planets under the Ptolemaic cosmology and finding that they're not where they're supposed to be. And what did they do for 1,500 years under Ptolemaic cosmology? They said, well, we know we're right about the paradigm, but we better put these little embellishments on. So what, what the quants do is they say, well, we know it's a bell curve. We know it's a normal distribution. But you know, every now and then, we got something up here. So we'll just draw a line and call it a fat tail. Or we'll say, you know, we're always operating in this zone. But yeah, every now and then, there are these weird events. And uh, we better use stress tests. So we better use something else. So what, what the quants and what the risk managers and what the banks uh, and what the, what the policymakers are doing is assuming that we're operating in this paradigm but we have some anomalous data, and we need to come up with some embellishments, some epicycles, if you will, 
to account for the data. I call it pinning the fat tail on the bell curve. Um, but there's another degree distribution. There's another paradigm. There's another way to think about risk in capital markets. And it's this curve on the right, which is called a power curve. Now, the power curve has some shared features with the bell curve. You notice, again, it slopes from left to right, which means that the extreme events happen less frequently, which you would expect. And the bulk of the observations are in here, which means these low impact events happen a lot of the time. Yes, that's true. But notice what happens. First of all, it degrades a lot more quickly. This is a lot steeper than that. And the interesting part is it gets down here and it keeps going. It never gets to the, uh, it never intersects the y-axis at zero as the bell curve does. So now when you have these events, it actually fits the curve. It fits the data. In other words, you don't have to embellish the bell curve to get to the right result. The power curve actually, the, the events happen very close to the curve, exactly where you would expect them to happen. So as a scientist, you look at this degree distribution, you say, I can't explain this except by making things up. But you look at this di degree distribution, you say, you know what, it's a perfect fit to the curve. Uh, that's very powerful evidence that maybe this is the way capital markets work. In fact, empirical observation says this is the correct degree distribution, and it does fit the extreme events that we actually observe. Now, the problem is, um, uh, the, this is not just a, a, a kind of academic debate between two different shaped curves, right? You go back to the circles and the ellipses, they were different shaped orbits, but they represented completely different systems. They weren't just differently shaped, they were representative of completely different ways of understanding. And that's the problem here, that this is not just, oh gee, who cares if it's shaped like this or this, you know, life, it's all good. It's not all good because this is a completely different system. The difference between the bell curve and the power curve um, is a couple things. Number one, the bell curve represents a system of random outcomes. The way to understand this, the way that finance quants talk about all the time, it's like flipping cards in a deck, right? You don't know what the next card is going to be. You don't know what it's going to be. But you do know with certainty that it'll be one of 52 cards. And you do know that if the king of hearts was, play, was played, the next card is not going to be the king of hearts. So there's a certain number of things you can know about it. We're rolling dice whether you get a one or a six, you don't know what the next roll of dice is going to be. But if you do it a million times and you can simulate that on a computer, you know you're going to get an equal distribution of, you know, two, three, four, up to 12, etc. Uh, same thing with a card, same thing with a coin toss. I could toss three heads in a row randomly, but if I do it a thousand times, I'm going to have roughly 500 heads and 500 tails. It might be 499 and 501 or 498 and 502, but it's not going to be 800 and 200. We can be highly certain of that. That's a random outcome. And it's not what's called path dependent, which is when I flip a coin, what I got the last time has absolutely no bearing on what comes up next. And that's, that's called the gambler's fallacy. You know, you throw three heads in a row, and the guy goes, oh, the next one's got to be tails. I'll bet a million dollars on tails. Bad bet. It's, it's a 50-50 chance whether it's heads or tails. It's rare to get four heads in a row, but if you happen to have three, it's still a 50-50 bet if the next one's going to be heads or tails. That is not path dependent. The next coin toss is not affected by what happened before. In a power law, which is representative of a complex system, that's not true. It is path dependent. And outcomes are not random. They depend on what happened before. And they're, they're not uh, independent of each other. They're highly sensitive to initial conditions. And also, these extreme events sort of come out of nowhere, uh, the so-called black swan. But actually, in, in understanding the science behind it, um, it is a, there's a causal effect. But the complex system is so complex that you can't trace it. And this is actually what, what Hayek and, and Mies and others were referring to. I don't want to say Austrians are complexity theorists, but if you look at the writings of Hayek and look at the writings of Austrians, you know, complexity theory didn't really come along until the 1960s. Most of the Austrian school was well developed by the 1940s. But I, I like to say when I debate my Austrian friends, if Mies were alive today, he'd be a complexity theorist because actually it's a very good explanation of how, you know, as Hayek would say, no mind can possibly comprehend all the moving parts. No mind can gather and process all the data you need to be a central planner, therefore central planning fails. Complexity theory is, is a perfect, uh, perfect fit with that. Now, I want to just take that one step further and ask the question, are capital markets complex systems? If they're not, you know, you can kind of skip the rest of the presentation. But if they are, 
that's a very powerful insight because you can take 60 years of complexity theory and import it to the capital markets as a way of understanding capital markets. Now you've got your elliptical orbits with the sun at the middle as opposed to your circular orbits with the earth at the middle. You've got the right paradigm. This will greatly increase your understanding of risk and portfolio composition and investing, et cetera. Well, there are four hallmarks of a complex system, four main characteristics. And I've listed them here, and I'll go through them briefly. And by the way, these are not things I pulled out of a hat to sort of retrofit to what I understand about capital markets. If you went to university and you took a physics course from someone who knew nothing about finance, this is what they would teach you. So this is physics. Um, the first one is diversity. So think of a system as having autonomous agents. So everyone in this room is, is an agent, right? We're all, in, we're all sort of, we make up our own mind about things. Well, you need diversity. If everybody thinks the same thing all the time, that's not a complex system. That's a really boring system. That's pretty static. So, you know, you need bulls and bears, fear and greed, leverage and non-leverage, long and short. Well, we've certainly got that in capital markets. Capital markets are, are uh, you know, exemplify that. The second thing you need is connectedness, right? So let's say we're diverse. We're all autonomous agents and we're diverse, but we're, we're, li we're cavemen and we're living in 50 different caves and we're not talking to each other. That's not a complex system because you have the diversity of views, but there's no connection between anybody, so you don't have a network. Well, are we connecting capital markets? Of course we are. We got you know, Bloomberg and Reuters and TV and BBC and CNBC and chat rooms and email and telephone. And we're probably overconnected, but there's no question about that. The third thing is interaction. Okay, so we got diverse agents. We think a lot of different things. We're all wired up and plugged in. We're all connected. Do we interact? Of course we do. There are trillions of dollars of daily turnover in foreign exchange, stock markets, bond markets, derivatives markets, commodity markets, et cetera. So that's an easy one. The fourth element is adaptability. Adaptability is just learning. Um, I manage a hedge fund, and I like to say uh, losing money is nature's way of telling you you're wrong. You have to, you know, if, you, if you're persistent in that, you'll go out of business. You have to adapt very quickly. So does my behavior affect your behavior and vice versa? And a good example, you know, you live in a flat and you wake up in the morning and you don't know what the weather's like, and you look out the window and you notice everyone's walking down the street in down jackets and hats and big mittens, you're probably not going to go outside in a sweater, right? You're probably going to put a heavy coat on. So that's an example of other people's behavior affecting your behavior. So these fall four hallmarks, diversity, connectedness, interaction, adaptability, not only are they characteristic of capital markets, I would say that uh, capital markets are the complex systems non -parel other than human beings themselves. We're, we're complex organic systems, but this is sort of putting human beings in a con network context of, of even greater complexity. Um, so capital markets, in my view, there's no doubt that they're complex <coughs> systems. If they're complex systems, which I say they are, you can then use everything we just talked about, about power laws, degree distributions, um, phase transitions, catastrophic outcomes, et cetera, to understand how, how capital markets actually work. I'm, I'm gonna skip the slides. I think we talked about a lot of this already. I'll give you um, an illustration. This is, um, this is a graphical representation of a, a density function, degrees of connectedness among actors in an economy. And just to explain, I apologize for the fact that the little tiny dots are a little bit hard to read, but I put these big dots there to illustrate. So we have, um, five sectors. The sectors are um, technology, uh, real estate, uh, basic, uh, basic materials, energy, and finance. So these are our five economic sectors. And this study was, was actually done by the London School of Economics. And they took 500 major companies, broke them into these sectors. So every company is a dot. So these little dots are companies. And then when they found some linkage between any two companies, they drew a line to connect them. So Morgan Stanley's in this bucket and IBM's over here, but if Morgan Stanley and IBM have an interlocking director, then that would be a line. Now obviously this wasn't done by hand, this is done on computer, but you pick your companies, you set your criteria, you have your sectors, you load your data, you push a button and the computer will give you this image. Now this uh, covers the period from 2003 to 2008. Now notice what's going on in 2003. Are the sectors connected? Of course they are, but they're distinct. These are five distinct sectors, a little bit of a five-headed monster. Uh, some degree of connection, but, uh, but you can see them distinctly. It's a spider or an octopus or whatever you want to call it. Now look at what happens between 2003 and 2008. 
two things are happening. Number one, the density function is increasing. They become less and less distinct, so that by 2008, it's kind of a blob. It's got a couple wings, but this is a blob compared to this, which looks more like a, a five-headed monster. The other thing is that the entire economy is being sucked into finance. The finance is at the middle. And one thing you notice here is that real estate has completely merged with finance. Think of the Lehman Brothers commercial real estate portfolio as an illustration of that. Now, here's the point. Ben Bernanke was quoted in 2007. When the crisis erupted, he said, and this is verbatim, he said, this will blow over. This is a temporary phase. This is going to blow over. I dare say a graduate student in complexity theory and graph theory and network theory with no understanding of capital markets whatsoever would have looked at this time series and looked at that and say, your system is on the verge of collapse. You are so densely connected that one problem anywhere in the system will very quickly propagate through the entire system and bring the whole thing tumbling down. Now, how is it the case that a grad student in physics could get a better forecast than the chairman of the Federal Reserve? The answer is the Federal Reserve is in a geocentric universe and the grad student's in the heliocentric universe. In other words, the physics student has the right paradigm and the chairman of the Fed has the wrong paradigm. And if you don't understand that this is how the world works, you will get the wrong result. Uh, but if you do understand it, your forecasting ability is, is very, very strong. Um, so that's a, a kind of a, a, a graphical and data-driven illustration of what I'm describing. Here's another one done by the IMF. Um, this is financial institutions only, so banks, insurance companies, et cetera, and the lines represent uh, contracts. And at the center of the universe, we have two suns here, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America. And again, I apologize for the fact that it's a little hard to read, but if you could read these, they would all be very familiar names. So uh, there's, there's Citibank and Goldman Sachs, et cetera, and then a lot of smaller regional institutions around the side. A couple things about this. Number one, I give the IMF a lot of credit for doing this. It means they're kind of on the right track. They, they don't know what they've done. They look at it and they think it looks scary, <laughs> and they're right. So they haven't gone all the way to embracing complexity theory, but, but nice job on the graphical representation. So the fact that it looks scary is good. Um, but they've done this on a net basis. They've done swaps and derivatives on a net basis. So if I owe you $5 billion and you owe me $4.9 billion, they count it as $100 million. That's the wrong way to understand it. Risk is in the gross. If you did this on a gross basis, this whole slide would be black. The density function would be so great that you wouldn't even be able to distinguish it. So they're on the right track, but they're not, they're not there yet. Um, I'm going to uh, well, spend a minute on this example. Uh, I want to kind of give you a note, make the point that not every complex system is in the critical state all the time. You can have the characteristics of complexity but you can have a degree of stability. The critical state is when the thing explodes or collapses. And, and one way to think about it, uh, imagine I've got 35 pounds of uranium and it's sitting on, it's a cube and it's sitting in front of you. It's actually not that dangerous. It's radioactive, but you'd have to eat it to really get sick. Uh, nothing bad, it's a complex system. You know, neurons are firing off, a lot of things are going on. Um, they're kind of unpredictable at the subatomic level, but nothing really bad is gonna happen. Now, I take the same 35 pounds, I shape one piece like the size of a grapefruit, I take another piece and shape it like a bat, I put them together and fire them together with high explosives, I kill 300,000 people. In other words, the shape of the material, the array of autonomous agents being the subatomic interactions, can go critical. So you can be subcritical or critical in the same material or the same basic substance. And it's that array, that organization of the autonomous agents that causes a collapse or some kind of catastrophic outcome. So uh, we can use the people in this room as an illustration. Um, so imagine that one of you got up right now and just ran out of the room really fast. What would the rest of you do? Probably nothing. You'd probably say, you know, the person got a text or they were late for something or whatever. They need another cup of coffee. You'd stay where you are. But what if... Half the room got off and ran out as fast as they could. What would the other half of you do? I dare say you'd be right behind them. You'd say, I don't know what's going on, but maybe the place is on fire. I don't want to be the last one to leave. Um, and uh, you know, I like to say when it comes to the collapse of the dollar, Paul Krugman will be the last guy out of the room. Uh, but, but the point is, in that example, uh, the, the, I want to illustrate the T factor. The T factor is your critical threshold. The critical threshold is the point at which other people's behavior affects your behavior. That's the interaction I talked about earlier. And in my example, with people running out of the room, your critical threshold 
is somewhere between 1 and 20. It's greater than 1, less than 20. The point is we all have different critical thresholds. Uh, and they change. They could be higher or lower on a certain day, depending on whether we feel good or feel nervous or whatever. So that complexity, not by 40 people or so in the room, but by a billion people waking up in the morning, interacting in capital markets, that array is impossible to comprehend except on a theoretical basis. But here you see two uh, cases. One, one is the critical state. Now I want to posit a population of about 310 million people. Uh, and the, the, the collapse I'm talking about is the collapse of confidence in the US dollar and, and with people repudiating the US dollar. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that you don't want dollars. You want to get out of them. So you, you buy art, you buy gold, you buy land, you buy something, but whatever it is, you're out of the dollar. Um, now, in, in the first case, um, I've set up the array as follows. So there are 1,000 people with a critical threshold of 500. It means if 500 people quit the dollar, they quit the dollar. They're running out of the room right behind them. And then there are another million people with a critical threshold of 10,000, et cetera. So here you can see the array. Now, what I want to posit is, so 100 people quit the dollar. That's your, that's your initial condition. That's your first event. 100 people say, I no longer have confidence in the dollar. What happens in the first case? The answer is nothing happens, because the critical threshold for the next echelon is 500. Unless 500 people quit the dollar, the next 1,000 people stay in their seats. They don't move. And since we only have 100, we don't hit the threshold for the next 1,000. So nothing happens. This is like throwing a match in a dry forest, and the match fizzles out, and nothing else happens. Now, look at case two. I've changed two things. I've lowered the threshold from 500 to 100 for the first 1,000. And I've lowered the threshold from 10,000 to 1,000 for the next million. But that's the only thing I've done. And that, I've left everything else the same. And those two uh, thresholds, that accounts for three ten thousandths of the population. Now 100 people quit the dollar. What happens? Well, if 100 people quit the dollar, you've hit the threshold for 1,000, so they quit. When 1,000 people quit, you've hit the threshold for a million, so they quit. When a million people quit, you're way past the threshold for 10 million, so they quit, and so on. You get this cascade, and the entire population loses confidence in the dollar. Now, here's, now this is where the dollar collapses. Now here's the point. I didn't have to change 300 million people's minds. I didn't have to convince 300 million people to quit the dollar. I only had to change three ten thousandths of one percent. But the array gave me the result because of the adaptability and the interaction that we described in complexity. So the point is the difference between a collapse of the dollar and a non-collapse of the dollar is minute in terms of the initial conditions that have to change once the array is right. It's like taking the uranium and shaping it differently and getting a completely different outcome. And this, the Fed does not understand this. This is why this is the nuclear reactor and this is the thermostat. This is stable and this is unstable. We are moving very quickly to the point of instability. I want to finish up with the collapse of the dollar. Uh, so I've, pos I've, I've explained why it will happen. I've explained how it will happen. Now I want to talk very briefly about when it will happen, uh, or sorry, what happens when it does. you got sort of four outcomes, multiple reserve currencies, SDRs, gold, and collapse. Uh, I'll go through them quickly. Uh, multiple reserve currencies is just, you know, the dollar is still a reserve currency, but it, it diminishes as a percentage of total reserves and shares a place with the yuan and sterling and the yen and all that. Uh, that that's something that's kind of favored by intellectuals. Uh, my own view is it's unstable because there's no anchor. It's one thing when gold is the anchor. It's another thing when the dollar is the anchor for the rest of the world, which it was from 1980 to 2010. But today it's not an anchor. And multiple reserve currencies, rather than mitigating the currency wars, actually exacerbates them. So that's an unstable system. SDRs, watch this space. This is favored by the power elites. Um, real simple way to explain it because uh, you can meet international monetary economists who don't understand what, how SDRs work. The Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. The ECB has a printing press. They can print euros. The IMF has a printing press. They can print SDRs. It's just world money printed by the SDR, handed out to the members. We won't have it in our pockets, by the way. We'll still have pounds or dollars. But the dollar in this example will be a local currency. Like when I go to Turkey, I get some Turkish lira. When you go to the US, you'll get some US dollars. It'll be good for taxi cabs and restaurants. But the important things in the world, balance of payments, settlements, the price of oil, 
the financial accounts of the 500 or so largest global corporations. Those will all be in SDRs. The next time we have a financial panic of the kind we had in 2008, it will be bigger than the Fed. I showed you how the Fed printed $4 trillion since 2008. We haven't had a liquidity crisis since 2009. There's no shortage of money. So, but printing $4 trillion, when there is a liquidity crisis, what's the Fed going to do? Print $8 trillion, $12 trillion? They're not going to be able to. The only clean balance sheet left in the world is the IMF, so they will reliquify the world with SDRs. So keep an eye on that. The third is a gold standard. Uh, I'll just go very quickly through this. This is the distribution of gold in the world. One of the reasons I'm a Euro bull is because Europe has the most gold. You take the 17 members of the European monetary system combined, they have 10,000 tons. U.S. has 8,000 tons, the IMF 3,000 tons, et cetera. Uh, China lies. They're showing themselves at 1,000 tons. They probably, they're probably up here around 4,000 tons and growing. Uh, we'll, we'll learn that officially uh, a year or so from now, but, but that's, that's the way it is. The point is, when you, take, um, when you take global money supply and divide it by the amount of gold, and, and th this is known. We know how much gold there is. We know how much money there is. Again, a seventh grade math, keep it simple. These are the implied non-deflationary prices of gold. You don't have to go to a gold standard. But if you do go to a gold standard and you don't want to cause deflation and you want to be able to support world trade with the amount of gold, these are the implied prices. What these numbers mean, GM is global money, global M1. That's 40% backing. So global M1 with 40% gold backing, implied price is $7,000 an ounce. Global M2, a larger definition of money, with 100% backing, the implied price is 44000 So don't leave here and tell people that Jim Rickards is predicting $44,000 gold. I'm not. I'm just showing you what the implied price would be if you go to a gold standard. My own view is that will come out somewhere in here, maybe around $10,000 an ounce. Um, the fourth outcome is a collapse, which I actually think is the most likely as a result of wishful thinking, denial, and delay among policymakers. Things will implode, and then you'll likely get uh, what I would describe as a neo-fascist response. Um, There's a little plug for my book. This is the uh, current book, and this is the new book coming out in April, and I uh, thank you very much. Larry Summers, you mentioned you used the word well-meaning. You sure about that? Is that a yeah? Look, I I know uh, I, I know a lot of these guys, and I worked with Nobelis and and a lot of finance PhDs, and my friends at the Fed. Um, yeah, I think I don't think there's a nefarious uh, conspiracy. I think they are smart. They are well-meaning. They work hard. The problem is they've labored, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years and what I describe as the old paradigm, and when you have that much time and effort invested in understanding things a certain way, uh, you're very reluctant to throw it off. And that was the point of the original illustration. Uh, we have 1,500 years of uh, incorrect cosmology before uh, new ideas came along and another 100 years before those ideas were accepted. So um, I, I would dispute his neo-Keynesian understanding of economics. I would dispute uh, the use of equilibrium models in a world that is not, that is uh, run on the basis of complexity, not equilibrium. Uh, I'd be happy to debate him, but, uh, but I don't think he's a bad guy. I just think he's, uh, I like to say they're not uneducated, they're miseducated. Yeah. Uh, just what's your opinion on the Austrian theory of the business cycle? Well, it's a really good question. I was actually in uh, uh, Bratislava not long ago, and you know, when you get to Central Europe, you're, the intellectual content is pretty strong, and they're big, big uh, followers of Hayek. Uh, and I was with a particularly hard shell Austrian, uh, who's a German scholar teaching in Spain, speaks about four languages. And we, all this guy wanted to talk about is Austrian economics. There's a complete and total explanation of everything you need to understand. My view is I uh, agree with what Austrian economics has to offer. And people, and I don't discuss it in my book, and I don't discuss it in my new book, and I get criticized for that, and they say, well, why don't you talk about Austrian economics? My answer is, I don't think I have anything to add. I mean, I would just say, go read Rothbard, go read Mises, go read Hayek. I don't think you need to hear from me on that subject. Uh, and I do agree with it, but where I part ways is that I think there are new things to say. You can, I think you can advance the state of the art. I think Austrians are a little, 
I think they're right, but they're right in a constrained way, and, and not fo if not fossilized, at least they put themselves in a box. Leave, a, leave, a, leave aside the fact that the Keynesians want to marginalize them. I think the Austrians themselves have put themselves in an Austrian box. And so anyway, I debated this guy for three days, and he wouldn't budge. He's like, Austrian's all you need to know. So finally, we were at the airport. We're in Zurich, and we're just about to part ways. And I, I said, I got to get this guy. And I said, here's the deal. I said, if Mises were alive today, he'd be a complexity theorist. Because complexity is actually where they were going. Now, you didn't have complexity theory until the 1960s. And Hayek didn't have the computing power and the idea of uh, set what are called cellular automata, which is a way you, you come up with agents and you model these. He didn't have that. He didn't have those tools. Uh, but if he had, he would have, I think my view is he would have embraced it because what Hayek was saying, what he did say in his 1947 uh, piece and his Nobel Prize speech, he said, he said, nobody is smart enough to get all the data and process all the data in a way that enables you to centrally plan an economy. And he was right. But that's, that's exactly what complexity theory is teaching. It's saying that, you know, all the, you know, I just described everything in theory and there's empirics to back it up. But that model I showed you, the critical state and the non-critical state, you can't actually do that. You can't go out and get 300 million people to tell you what their critical threshold is and how it changes every day because it interacts. You know, like I say, you, you feel bolder on some days than others. It changes over the course of the day. Uh, there's shades of gray, et cetera. And so you can understand it theoretically, and you can get a lot out of the theory, but you can't actually model it. And that's what Hayek was saying. So, so I. I agree with Austrians, I, but I do think there's new science, and I think if they're around today, they'd all be complexity theorists. So. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Roman uh, Skaskiu. Roman is a, an American of Ukrainian ancestry who now lives in the Ukrainian city where Ludwig Mises was, was born. The Bethlehem of Libertarianism, uh, which I prefer to, to call by its earlier German name, Lampek. Roman is a, is a writer, entrepreneur, and a veteran of the United States Army, where he was an infantry officer and a paratrooper. His writing about the military, Bitcoin, and Libertarianism has, for example, appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, at Mises.org, and in the Stanford magazine, where he once studied computer science. Roman recently co-authored uh, The Tea Party Explained with the distinguished Austrian school economist Yuri Maltsev. He has also contributed to anthologies and military fiction, including Fire and Forget, which was uh, published earlier this year. He is now writing a memoir about his last deployment in Afghanistan, which will be interesting to read. Roman has spoken at the PFS conference in, in Bodrum on Bitcoin as well as the role of the military. Uh, it's uh, a privilege to have him with, within our movement. I will now, he will now talk about Bitcoin. Uh, Roman, the, the stage is yours. And uh, thank you, uh, Andy and Emma, to, for giving me this opportunity to do one of my favorite things about Bitcoin, which is, uh, which is sharing what I know with my, my dear friends and libertarian colleagues. A uh, number of you were in Bodrum at the Property of Freedom Society, where I concluded uh, my lecture by giving out what was then $30 worth of Bitcoins and little coupons so you could all try it. That will not be happening again. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the, uh, the most important thing we can do during this, uh, this brief uh, lecture is to help you understand the nature of Bitcoin and to speculate about its future. Uh, slightly less important but also interesting is answering the question of whether or not Bitcoin is money. And I will entertain that just briefly. Uh, but I want to first point out that moneyness is not a, a binary characteristic. If you take even the Austrian explanation of the emergence of gold as a commodity money, there was no moment in time where nobody went from believing gold was money to everybody went from believing it was money. So 
It is inevitable that a minority of people consider something to be money prior to a majority of people considering it to be money. But uh, I, will, I will entertain right now just the, the colloquial definition of money, which I believe to be the important definition of money. I think the Mises Menger definition was very much uh, focused on the task he had at hand, which was distinguishing legal from economic money and distinguishing claims on money from, from money itself. So the colloquial definition, as I understand it, has exactly three characteristics. Um, medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account. Daily Bitcoin transactions um, in dollars are about 200 million every day, although it's hard to parse that and say how much of that happens between two different individuals. So if I, if I switch Bitcoins between my wallets or if I buy them on an exchange, it also counts into that, but that is still a, a significant figure. Um, medium of exchange. A uh, store of value, um, Fidelity uh, this week made a strange announcement that they would start having some sort of Bitcoin related IRA and then backtracked on that statement. But nevertheless, I know many people in the Bitcoin community who are already saying that they, uh, they, don't, trust, uh, they don't trust the dollar as much as they trust Bitcoin and are using Bitcoin as a store of value. Uh, the third characteristic is unit of account. Uh, admittedly, this is the weakest characteristic uh, for which Bitcoin satisfies the conditions for money. Um, I know of just a couple things that are denominated in Bitcoin. One is uh, mining hardware. Um, some manufacturers of Bitcoin mining hardware, not all of them, but some of them do price their hardware in terms of Bitcoins. Uh, I also know of at least one um, journal that uh, they pay their writers in terms of Bitcoins per visits, regardless of the exchange rate. <laughs> I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that Bitcoin does not yet satisfy a uh, unit of account and is not money yet, but we are arguing, we are disagreeing over degrees whether Bitcoin has crossed the necessary threshold yet, and it does seem to be trending in the correct direction. Uh, so let's return to the more important task, which is uh, helping you understand the, the nature of, uh, of Bitcoin and speculate about its futures. I want to tell you five interesting and important things about Bitcoin. Uh, most people understand that it is decentralized. There have been earlier attempts at electronic money. There was a company called eGold, which functioned out of Costa Rica for 10 years. Uh, users of eGold were pseudonymous, just like users of Bitcoin. They, they needed to create an identity, but no effort was made to see that it was a real identity. And people can, uh, can send this e-gold to each other. It was backed by real gold that this company kept in their vaults. And they could specify amounts down to one-tenth of one gram. Uh, there was also Liberty Reserve, a uh, similar idea, although there was, there was no gold. They just specified Liberty Reserve dollars, Liberty Reserve euros. Um, these were both centralized, and after, after a while, the, the United States authorities found reason to shut them down. So Bitcoin is, of course, decentralized. That's its main characteristic. Uh, my wallet that I have on my laptop continually downloads the ledger, which is called the blockchain, of all the transactions happening in the world. Being decentralized is important because there is no one to shut down. There are no computers to confiscate. There is no one to put in jail. There is no business to close down that would stop Bitcoin. Um, it's a, a little bit like file sharing. Um, but, uh, but file sharing is detectable based on uh, traffic analysis. Whereas Bitcoin, you're sending very small amounts of data back and forth. So Bitcoin is much harder to detect than, uh, than file sharing. Uh, Bitcoin is open source. That's a, another very important characteristic. So if you buy uh, Microsoft Windows or Apple software or, or Photoshop, you only receive the code in computer readable language. And it is too complex for a human being to reasonably sort through and find out what's happening. Bitcoin is available in human readable form. So any programmer can go and look at it and see exactly what it's doing. There are no secrets in the code. And a, a programmer himself can translate it from human readable to computer readable before running it. So there are no secrets in the Bitcoin protocol. Um, changes are adopted by consensus. Uh, if there's a, a small change, some people that's 
that's backward compatible, some people will adopt it, others will not, and the system will continue to function. Uh, on the rare occasions that there is a significant change to Bitcoin, which will not be backward compatible, there's a huge period of consensus building before that change is adopted. And the worst thing that can happen is, uh, is not so bad. If some people adopt the change and others refuse, um, you'll just have a split, a fork. And there will be Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2, and they will both continue to operate. Uh, that's important because there's talk of, uh, I think some, some critics say that it's, it's too easy to take over, it's too easy to, to ruin, but it's not. Open source software gives it a huge amount of robustness. Um, and even if they do find some critical flaw in the Bitcoin protocol, which at this point seems unlikely, there are hundreds of uh, imitators just chomping at the bit to take over the number one spot. So the cat's out of the bag and it's not going back in. Uh, the, the imitators, which are known collectively as altcoins, um, they've been a, a great place for experimentation. Uh, some of them have seen very sophisticated attacks, uh, including attacks that have been the subjects of PhD dissertations uh, at Cornell University in particular. Um, and at worst, these attacks were minor, minor disruptions. So it's, it's just been a good place for the crypto community to learn about, to learn about these systems and what they can handle. Number three, Bitcoin mining. Uh, you hear a lot of discussion of Bitcoin mining, and I'll try to put it in layperson's terms. Uh, for, for transactions to be secure, it was necessary for some computers somewhere to do math. And, and in the original idea, who would expend electricity and who would dedicate computers to do this math uh, in order to keep Bitcoin secure? So the idea from the very beginning was that new Bitcoins would arrive um, on the computers at which this math takes place. Uh, right now they arrive at about 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And this falls by half approximately every four years. So the number of Bitcoins right now is about 12 million, and it'll level off at around 21 million, and that'll happen in a little over 100 years. Yeah, to, um, I guess to understand mining a little bit more deeply, uh, I would say that transactions are not written to the ledger individually, they're written in blocks. The ledger is called the blockchain, and it's the, uh, it's the computers that solve a math problem on this block of transactions that gets the reward. So if you read about mining, you see the language of a competition. Different mining pools are competing, and the, the, just the, with computing power, the more computing power they have, the more likely they are to solve this math problem, and the more likely they are to have the privilege of writing the next block to the ledger and thus receiving the award. That's mining. Two more things. I want to talk about anonymity and some events on the Bitcoin horizon. Um, much has been made of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's anonymity being broken, and I think pseudonymous is a more accurate description than anonymous. But I think the bad news is being overreported. For example, if you want it to be perfectly anonymous, which was hugely inconvenient, but you can do it this way, by buying a computer with cash, you want to be very paranoid, put a little piece of electric tape over the webcam. Uh, you can never use that computer to log on to Facebook or any of your standard email accounts. And you can only use that computer on public networks like in restaurants or hotels. And then the best they could do is trace that <coughs> computer to the IP address of the restaurant you were at. And then you could download a Bitcoin client it doesn't require any registration, and then all you would have to do is find some secure way of communicating your address. So no, nothing in this explanation, in this 100% anonymous usage of Bitcoin is, is technically challenging. So, so that's one thing. I think it is overreported. Um, with casual usage of Bitcoin, the way I use it, because I have nothing to hide, I use it at home on my regular computer. Bitcoin allows you to create as many addresses as you want, and if I send a big transaction, it might cluster some of those addresses together. So it does leak a little bit of information, but even that is improving. Some of the best cryptographers in the world 
are working on a protocol called ZeroCoin, which sits on top of Bitcoin and should make it pseudon uh, fully anonymous. Um, there are third-party coin mixers and scramblers, so you could send your Bitcoins and get others back. And, uh, and there are other solutions as well. Uh, in a word, I think, I think the, the anonymity problem is being overreported. And even if it was as bad as, as is being reported, I think it, it still beats dollars, but that's, that'll be a discussion for later. A uh, couple events on the Bitcoin horizon. Um, Bitcoin will go through some growing pains. Right now it processes about a transaction every second. Uh, Visa, by contrast, has a daily peak of about 4,000 transactions per second and an annual peak before Christmas time of about uh, 20,000 transactions per second. Bitcoin needs to change um, in a pretty deep way before it can handle that kind of volume. So it will go through, through some growing pains. Uh, these are technical problems. These are not difficult technical problems, but uh, if if, the, if it grows more quickly than the developers fix it, we will see a slowdown and you will see um, a huge crash in the price followed by a resurgence as we hope, in my opinion. But the skepticism is very important and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, so in these last couple minutes, um, I want to try to describe the two paradigms that I see among people for, uh, for understanding Bitcoin. And, the, and which paradigm you come from kind of dictates whether you're a pessimist or an optimist. And, and the first is that of a commodity. And this is what I often hear from people in big finance. They consider it just another commodity, just like the, the tulips were. And the price is going up, and then the price is going to go down. The second paradigm is uh, that of a new technology, uh, that of uh, something that allows you to do something which was previously impossible. and. Uh, and if you believe it's a new technology, then it'll follow a, a technology adoption curve, which they always look the same, whether it's electricity or, or some, um, cellular phones or washing machines. They, they rise slowly in the innovator phase, then they parabola on mass adoption, and then they level off. Of course, if you trace the technology far enough, maybe a rival technology comes out, and then there's a, a backside to that curve. But uh, I, I personally believe that it's a technology adoption curve in the long term. And I think right now it's, it's still very small compared to the other, the other monies that are out there. And I think, uh, I think it has a huge upside. But the skepticism is also very important. And uh, I'm right at my 15 minute mark. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Okay, so now we're, uh, I think, uh, when this presentation is done, we're going to go to a debate format, so I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to state the case for uh, gold as money, and then Roman will state the case for Bitcoin as money, and then we'll have two rounds of rebuttal, and then lunch. Uh, so, um, uh, let's talk about gold uh, a little bit, and why it's um, the best form of money, and I would certainly agree that Anything can be money uh, at various times, various places. Uh, feathers have been money, clamshells have been money. Um, so I don't, I don't doubt that Bitcoin is money. I don't dispute the fact that Bitcoin is a, is a kind of money. And Roman gave the three part definition, said maybe we're two and a half parts to a uh, three toward satisfying that. But I'll give Bitcoin the benefit of the doubt, so it'll, it'll get to all three. But, but let's uh, we'll come back in, that, in the next round. We'll just talk about gold a little bit. Um, the first thing about gold, it's important to understand, it is genuinely scarce. Uh, you know, you've probably heard of what are called rare earths. Rare earths are special uh, minerals that are used in various technological applications. They're uh, found in very low density, uh, different places around the earth. Well, gold is far more rare than rare earths. Rare earths are actually plentiful. The reason they're called rare earths is because the amount of ore you have to dig up to get a little bit of it is huge. They're, they're, they're scarcely uh, thinly distributed, but they're actually around with different quantities. Whereas gold is, is genuinely scarce. But the entire effort of the mining industry 
on a worldwide basis. And that, that effort has been extensive the last uh, 10 years because the price of gold has gone up so much. I should say the dollar price of gold has gone up so much in the last 10 years. Um, all that output adds about 1.5% to the stock every year. So it's estimated there are about 165,000 tons of gold in the world. So that goes up about 1.5% a year. So really just um, uh, uh, you know, just a few thousand tons, about uh, two, two to 3,000 tons every year. Um, that's important because the economy is growing at a certain pace and if gold were everywhere, uh, it would be very unstable as a store of value. It, the dollar price of gold would be a lot more volatile. Um, it wouldn't be very valuable as a store of wealth. That's one of the three-part definition. But that, that scarcity is, uh, is very important. And actually, there's a feedback loop between production and scarcity. People say, well, what about the California gold rush of 1849? Well, the gold came into the market all at once, and that's true. And there were some major discoveries in the, in the late 19th century. But what happens is that when you have that much gold coming on the market quickly, and that has been rare throughout history, it has happened, but it's, it's very rare, it causes inflation. If gold is money, and you put a lot of money in the system quickly, you do get an uh, inflationary uh, spike, which makes the money um, you know, temporarily less, va less valuable. Uh, but then you get into periods of scarcity. So, that, so then what happens is your mining costs go up because of inflation, mining becomes less profitable, mining slows down. The, the converse is true in periods where, of, of deflation, where, where gold is, is more valuable. That attracts more people to mining. Uh, you know, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I think it's interesting in the Bitcoin world, they've actually used the term mining uh, to describe what's going on. A lot of Bitcoin was patterned on gold in the sense that it was going to be scarce. These Bitcoins can only be created at a very slow pace. You need more and more computing power. Uh, to produce them, that's exactly like the capital investment that goes into mining to produce gold. So they were the Bitcoin creators were consciously imitating gold and gold production, gold mining to to create what they've done. Um, second thing about gold, it's an it's an element. It's atomic number seventy nine. Gold is gold. Uh, it's not anything else. So you look at other commodities because people say, well, gee, couldn't you have an oil standard or couldn't you have a grain standard or a corn or wheat standard, etc. The answer is you could, uh, but those things all come in various grades. I mean, oil, you know, we talk about West Texas and Brandon's benchmark prices, but there are actually 70 or 80 major grades of oil around the world, depending <coughs> on viscosity and sulfur content and, and other variables. Same thing with uh, corn, if you trade corn futures um, and the Chicago futures market. They have very detailed specifications about what kind of corn you're allowed to deliver and it can't have certain impurities, and et cetera. That's not a problem with gold. It's an element. It is what it is. Uh, so there's no such thing as near gold or corrupt gold or pseudo gold. I mean, you can make, you can make 14 karat gold, but that just means you put an alloy in. It's not all gold. So that uniformity is, is very important. Um, gold has very, to talk really about the reasons why it's money good, uh, has very high density. If you've ever held a gold coin or a gold bar in your hand, the first thing that you notice is it's heavy. So when, it's a gold coin in your hand, about it weighs, weighs a lot. Well, it does. Um, I, I happened to uh, pick up a, a 400 ounce bar recently. I was in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, and it's I have a picture of me smiling, but we don't see the pictures. I was straining to hold it up. It's, 20, it's like a 25 pound free weight, it's just a small 400 ounce bar. So it has that density, which means you get a lot of value for the weight. It's scarce, dense, pure. Uh, it's malleable. Gold is very easy to work with, so if you want to coin it or shape it or uh, turn it into uh, uh, valuable objects, that's, that's fairly easy to do. Um, people talk about the industrial uses of gold. I, I say there aren't any, there are some. Uh, they, they use it to coat space helmets and they use it in certain electronic applications. And people, uh, official statistics count jewelry as um, a, a different use of gold than money, but I dispute that. To me, jewelry is just money that you wear. Uh, and you go to India and you look at the gold necklaces, it's very pretty. Uh, it's attractive, but that's really the wealth and net worth of the individual that happens to be worn kind of decoratively around their neck, same thing with a watch or, or a bracelet and so forth. Um, so it has these, uh, has these characteristics, you know, uniformity, density, malleability. It's nice to look at and it's pretty. Uh, that's not a big part of the case, but you know, it's a, it's a nice sort of benefit. But above all, what gold really has is uh, longevity. It has been money good throughout the entire 
history of civilization. Now, it wasn't always coined and used as money, but it has always had valuable uh, a value. It's always been considered uh, a source of wealth. The, uh, the uh, sources are historical, uh, they're biblical, archaeological. Um, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. I think it, that's fairly, um, fairly evident. Um, people say that there's not enough gold to support finance and world trade. That's, that's a sort of a risible objection. There's always enough gold. It's a question of price. Uh, there may not be enough gold at $1,200 an ounce, but there's plenty of gold at $10,000 an ounce. That was part of the presentation I did earlier. So there's always enough gold. You just have to get the, the price right if you're trying to, uh, trying to support um, uh, money supply. Um, and the last point I would make, and we're going to have some time for, uh, for rebuttals, but um, you can have um, discretionary monetary policy combined with a gold standard. People say, well, if we, have a, if we have a gold standard and there's a financial panic or a crisis or a depression and you need to create money, what are you going to do? There's only so much gold. You're sort of feeding the deflation. We talked a little bit about that. Well, you can have a gold standard, gold-backed money, and a discretionary monetary policy side by side. But what you have to do is hold your feet to the fire in terms of monetary policy by conducting open market operations of gold. You have to be willing to stand up to the market. So let's say you want to set the price of gold at $5,000 an ounce. Well, what a central bank has to do in that world is not just dictate that, but actually say, okay, gold is $5,000 an ounce. I am a seller and a buyer. I'm a buyer at $49.95 and a seller at $50.50. And if you think gold is cheap, come and get it. We'll, we'll ship it to you, you know, right out of Fort Knox. If you think gold is expensive, drop off your gold, we'll give you some money. So you have to stand up to the marketplace. So now you've got this financial panic. You want to print a lot of money to ease the situation. You can do that, but you'll find out very quickly by people's behavior whether they believe you or not. If that's good policy and people support it, they will not come down and buy all your gold. They'll say, you're doing the right thing. If you're abusing the privilege, if you're uh, trying to create inflation, if you're trying to destroy wealth, if you're trying to steal savings, then people won't trust you and they'll say, yes, I'll take the gold, thank you very much. So, so that way, that's how open market operations combined with discretionary monetary policy can work side by side using price signals, which is a very Austrian concept, to tell you, to guide your monetary policy, to tell you if you're on the right track or not. So just to summarize, uh, it's got, it's uniform grade, it's atomic element, it's malleable, it's dense, it's got a long historical track record. It's flexible. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it's tangible. If you have physical gold in your possession, you have money that does not rely on any degree of trust. If you have it in a bank, you're trusting the bank. If you have it in GLD form, you have it on a COMEX future, you're trusting the exchange, you're trusting some other party. But if you have physical gold in your possession, you didn't lose the leverage to buy it, so the bank can't come and take it away, uh, that's money with no element of trust of any third party. It's the ultimate form of money and the foundation of all other kinds of money. So, well, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs>
and and Bitcoin's advantages over physical gold to to me seem seem fairly obvious. Uh, you can transport it anywhere in the world uh, almost instantly for free. Um, it's easier to to verify it. There have never been fraudulent bitcoins. Uh, it's more divisible. You know, if you're if you're stuck with a you know, I have a one ounce gold coins, you know, I'd, I'd have to buy, I'd have to have some intermediate money, like maybe I would trade it for a whole bunch of cigarettes and they'll deal with the cigarettes when I want to buy coffee for gold, but Bitcoin lends itself perfectly. Every Bitcoin is, is divisible down to eight decimal places. Um, and, uh, and we heard that, that physical gold requires no trust, sort of. I mean, you, you're trusting, you're trusting, uh, you're trusting society against you know physical aggressions against your property, or is uh, it's easier to hide Bitcoin than it than it is to hide gold, and it's easier to transport Bitcoin than it is to, to transport gold. So so in, in some in some ways, uh, Bitcoin requires less trust than physical gold. But I think the the more interesting comparison is to talk about electronic representations of gold, which have existed in the past, uh, back when entrepreneurs were allowed to do them. And I think the, the biggest uh, rival to Bitcoin will come, I, I hope it comes in, in my lifetime, but it'll come when the fiat system is, is dead and buried and entrepreneurs aren't afraid of engineering gold to behave like Bitcoin. Um, then you can have, then you can do with gold everything that you do with Bitcoin from the user's point of view. You could send it across boundaries for free and trust that some company is just keeping the accounts accurate in a vault somewhere far away. Um, this is how e-gold functioned um, before all their gold was seized. It was one of the largest seizures of physical gold ever. Um, but, uh, but even then, even then uh, there is still a case to be made for Bitcoin because, you know, I don't know if their e-gold's vaults were in Costa Rica or somewhere in the United States. I don't know where they kept it but that's still a physical risk of someone coming in and taking the gold. No such risks exist with Bitcoin. Um, you're still trusting a third party if you use electronic gold, whereas Bitcoin is person to person, no third party whatsoever. Uh, E-gold had an annual, annual peak of about, uh, or had a, in their, in their decade, in their decade of existence, the most annual transactions were about a billion. And that was right before they were shut down. Bitcoin is already doing 200 million a day. So if you, if you add that up, it comes out to like 7 trillion something. So would somebody trust a, a business, a electronic gold business enough that they would build additional software and internet infrastructure to support the exchange of their currency? Uh, Bitcoin is a protocol and it has no owner and that's very attractive to software developers and I think that's why there's so much more action on Bitcoin than there ever was with eGold. Um, relying on that third party also creates the potential for uh, a Google Reader problem. A Google Reader was a very popular reader that, that people would get their news from but it belonged to Google and one day de they decided they wouldn't support it anymore and they shut it down. You know, why would uh, programmers, why would programmers build infrastructure on top of the next e-gold when it's controlled by someone? I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying that even in such a situation, there's still a case to be made for Bitcoin, which would not belong to anybody and which would be peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third parties. Uh, last point I want to make. Um, you believe, most of us believe, or at one point believe that, that money should be a commodity. But I think even more fundamentally, we believe that markets choose their money. Markets choose their money. And I think when we, when we see the flight from the dollar, that network effect that we saw you know, in, the, in the earlier presentation, I think the door is wide open for Bitcoin in a way that it is not open for gold. I don't know of any restaurants that accept gold. I don't know of, of any place where you could buy electronics for gold. Um, there's a libertarian conference that happens every year in New Hampshire called Porkfest. Uh, and they, they really try to live uh, absent the state. And with that in mind, they used to trade in silver. 
their, their little bazaar that they set up. This is a very small anecdotal example, and I may be guilty of a confirmation bias, but they had a little market at this conference every year where they traded in silver. This past year, no silver whatsoever. It was all in Bitcoin. So I'll leave it at that for now. We'll do a few minutes of rebuttal and then back over to Roman for the, uh, for the last word. So this uh, conference is called Intellectual Minds, which implies a certain broad-mindedness or open-mindedness. And I think um, Roman is definitely a lot more open-minded than I am because he said he owns gold and bitcoins, and I own gold. Uh, so he's, uh, I think, a little more uh, forward-leaning in that regard. Um, a couple things about uh, bitcoin specifically. Uh, one thing that's overlooked is that, uh, can big, is Bitcoin a form of money? Sure. Is it a, a kind of money? I, I don't dispute that. Uh, but it's not state money. And here we have to go back to the state money theory, which has uh, really evolved in Germany in the uh, early 1920s, uh, later called chartalism. Uh, today runs under the banner of modern monetary theory. But it says that money derives its uh, value from the fact that the state can require it uh, in the form of taxes under pain of death in the extreme case. And so uh, the problem with Bitcoin is if you buy your Bitcoins for $100 equivalent and you cash them in or exchange them for $200 of goods and services under certainly US tax code in UK and I think most countries, you have a $100 gain in that example. You bought the Bitcoin for 100, you swapped it for something that was worth 200, you have a $100 gain, leave aside whether that's ordinary income or capital gain, you have to put that on your tax return and you have to pay dollar taxes on the game. I dare say that there are practically no Bitcoin users in the world, exception of Roman, who are actually tax compliant, who are actually doing this on their tax returns, um, which means that all the Bitcoin users are tax evaders, uh, which is a felony in most jurisdictions. Uh, for people who don't think that the government's watching, I would refer them to a gentleman named uh, Snowden, I think now residing in Russia, who has told us enough about the NSA capabilities and their encryption capabilities and decryption capabilities. Um, we also have an IRS scandal in the US which shows that the IRS has been perverted to do selective politically based enforcement. So I think what's going on is that between the NSA and the IRS and organs of the US government and the Inland Revenue and uh, um, your uh, general headquarters, I think is what they call the uh, our equivalent of the NSA, are watching all this. And uh, someday, sooner than later, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people around the world, are going to get deficiency notices from the tax authorities saying, we've observed the following transactions. We've also observed that you didn't put this on your tax return. Um, you know, come in and give us an explanation. Of course, you're all felons at that point. Uh, and if you happen to be on the wrong side of the political divide, you might be subject to uh, incarceration. So that's coming. Uh, just kind of put that down as a warning and one reason to think hard about, um, about Bitcoin. Um, I'm actually very serious when I say that. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, the, um, I talked about anything being a form of money. By the way, um, we're all familiar with, uh, with what's called the straw man argument, where you create a straw man so you can go knock it down and say, see, I knocked down that straw man. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Roman spent two thirds of his time talking about the deficiencies of e-gold. I never mentioned e-gold. I don't advocate e-gold. Uh, Roman basically put up a straw man that he attacked. I'm not talking about e-gold. I'm not talking about COMEX futures. I'm not talking about GLD. I'm not talking about ETFs. I'm talking about gold. So gold is no one's liability. I think no one's done a better job than the Austrians of pointing that out. It's the only form of money that's not a liability. You say, what's a dollar or a pound sterling? Uh, you know, I learned in the first week of law school, if you have a contract, you're supposed to read the contract. Take a, uh, take a, again, I'm familiar with dollars, take a dollar bill out of your wallet, or take a pound sterling, and look at what it says. Look at the writing. That's the contract. It says it's a note. It's a Bank of England note, or in the case of U.S. dollars, a Federal Reserve note. Where I went to law school, a note is a liability. Indeed, if you look at the balance sheet of a central bank, the money that they've created is listed on the liability side of the balance sheet. So it has no interest and has no maturity, uh, but you can think of money as a perpetual, perpetual non-interest bearing liability of a central bank, and these days the central banks are actually insolvent. So there, the amount of trust in using that as a form of money is extremely high. And the reason clamshells and feathers and other 
media of exchange were accepted as money was because others in the system trusted that they had value. I would take a clamshell as money because I trusted that when I wanted to spend it, somebody else would take the clamshell as well. That works fine in, in communities. It works fine in tribes. It works fine on a limited scale where the trust is high. But the minute you broaden the community so that you're no longer in direct contact with people, you're relying on a degree of trust that may be misplaced. So Bitcoin is really a, a global community at this stage. I expect that will grow. Uh, but you're trusting uh, um, Sakimoto, whether he was an individual or a team, uh, whether he was working for Google, we're not quite sure. But uh, the creators of Bitcoin, uh, you know, we don't know that there aren't uh, you know, so-called trapdoors or hidden uh, aspects of the code. In open source, you probably figure that out sooner or later. Uh, but finally, the, the ultimate trust is that um, when, when will you want your money the most? Let's call it your store of wealth, and let's refer specifically to gold. When will you want it the most? You'll want it the most when society is at its worst. In other words, if things are good, uh, somehow the Fed stops printing money and the dollar stabilizes. By the way, I'm often labeled as a gold bug. I'm actually not a gold bug. I spend a lot of time reading and writing, researching and talking about gold. Uh, I'm a bit of an old school imperialist. I favor a strong dollar, the so-called king dollar policy. The problem is that's not what we have. Uh, I may favor it, but my, my preference is irrelevant. The policy of the United States is to weaken the dollar. That's why I, I lean to gold. But um, at the end of the day, uh, if society actually collapses, uh, your gold will be money good. And by the way, there's a role for silver as well, not to change it up, but that's an answer to the denomination problem. I recommend people have a what we call a monster box, 501 ounce American silver eagles. So you can think of silver as fractional gold, so you don't have to sit there with a, a file and kind of chip off little pieces of your gold coin, because I agree that a gold coin in that world is probably a year's worth of groceries, not a week's worth of groceries. Uh, so there might be a role for silver there. But at the end of the day, uh, you don't have to trust anyone to find your value in gold. Uh, and Roman talked about Bitcoin being kind of outside the power of the state. That really is wishful thinking. The state is watching. They're waiting for you. They control the portals. Uh, you probably, if you're a Bitcoin user, you're probably a tax evader. And last time I checked, the uh, uh, last time I checked, the uh, the state runs the power grid. And uh, good luck with your Bitcoins when the power goes out. <laughs>
Oh, right. Well, I think without power, the, you know, the legacy, what I like to call the legacy banking system, maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think without power, the, the legacy banking system will, will be out, out of luck just as much as Bitcoin. And when the power comes back on, the, the blockchain is still there. So I wouldn't worry about that. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's mostly it. I mean, I guess the, the amount of time I spent on, uh, on e-gold was just because I thought the advantages over physical gold were, were fairly obvious, more transportable, um, you know, more verifiable, more divisible. Um, maybe we should want to take questions now. Maybe that will trigger some more good discussions. Okay. So, so maybe please uh, ask which one of us should, should answer the question. And, uh, and then ask the question, and we'll share the mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you'll be able to enlighten me just on a question I have. First of all, as many of you will know, uh, Carl Menger wrote a book on the origin of money, and he, in, in his theory, which Mises then built upon, was that money has to have its origin in the marketplace, as two important words, <laughs> as a consumer good. So both of these two words are important. Consumer, as in it is purchased for a reason in and of itself. So all the different types of money in history are a consumer good, gold, it was worn as jewelry, but also as a good. And Menger also defines good as having four characteristics, the most important of which is scarcity. So I have a question with regards the scarcity of this digital currency. Not that we all understand that it is mined and it is released at a certain period of time, but the fact that the what makes Bitcoin um, scarce is its uniqueness, in that it's, it was the first digital currency to be released as far as I'm aware. But what is stopping multiple other new digital currencies being created? Okay. Um, well, you don't have infinitely many, but there are uh, hundreds. I think there's around two or three hundred alternatives to Bitcoin. They're collectively known as altcoins, sure. uh, and they've been a great playground for experimentation. Uh, one of the funniest ones is called Frycoin, which I call Keynesian coins, uh, because its creator had the idea that you need to spend your money or else it's bad for the economy. So they depreciate in value if you hold on to them too long. Uh, <laughs> Others, others are tied up with, uh, one can be a new, uh, a new protocol for the ownership of domain names. There's one called Namecoin. Uh, right now, if, uh, you know, say the, the government wants to seize the domain property in freedomsociety.org, um, if, uh, if, if, the, if it was property in freedomsociety.bit, and it, it's, it's the ownership of the domains was regulated by Namecoin, they would be non-seizable. Uh, another one is, uh, is called PrimeCoin, and in their mining algorithms, they do something that's potentially useful for mathematics. They generate very big prime numbers for the ma mathematicians to play with. Okay, I'm getting off on a tangent just because I love this topic. Uh, well, a scarcity. Okay, um, right, and Menger. Okay, so scarcity. I think uh, there are many metaphors for, for Bitcoin. I think one of the best ones is a big ledger, and you're renting space in this ledger. So uh, it's not scarcity in the commodity sense, but it's, it's maybe scarcity in, in the service sense. And I think if you wanted to make things like, the, uh, like Mises' regression, uh, regression theorem work with Bitcoin, you have to do a little bit of, of gymnastics and argue that it's a service and not a commodity. And it's a service that predates Bitcoin. You know, before Bitcoin came on the scene, I paid uh, $30 for wire transfers from one country to another, or I, I paid a, um, what is it, a two point something percent for PayPal transactions, or credit cards take their percentage. So, so a demand for this service does predate the existence of Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin arrives, think of it not as a coin, but as a ledger, and you rent space in this ledger in order to use it 
for the sending of money. And I think that's the best way to square Bitcoin with, with Mises and Menger. But I'm also not sure if that, how valuable an exercise that is, because they were very much engaged in, in you know, untangling all the mediums of exchange of their day, which is why I, I think the colloquial definition of money is best. Thank you. Just, just to add uh, to what Roma says, I actually think Bitcoin passes the scarcity test maybe too well because it has a limit. Is it 24 million? Is the I think it's around 21 million. 21 million or so Bitcoin. The way the algorithm is set up, that you, you won't be able to produce any more after that. Now, the problem with that is it's highly uh, deflationary if you measure the price of goods in Bitcoin. In other words, if you cap out the amount of Bitcoin but the economy continues to grow, the value of a Bitcoin will go up uh, enormously. So eventually, you know, in the extreme, one Bitcoin would be able to buy an entire country with it because the economy would have grown to the point where, you know, the, the Bitcoins are fixed. So they may have to solve that problem, but it gets back to the community that Roman described. A lot of people object to the gold standard, and I would distinguish a gold standard from gold because gold is just money, and if you have it, you have money, you have a store of wealth. But a gold standard is this is a system where you take a paper chit, you know, in effect a, a warehouse receipt, but probably not that good, that's fixed to gold. So there's gold in the vault, and we circulate paper, and the paper has some fixed relationship to the gold, and you trust that. But the history is that countries abuse the trust. They periodically devalue the currency, uh, they'll uh, confiscate the gold, they'll do various things to break that trust, and that's happened over, over again. That's an objection to a gold standard. It's a valid objection. But you have the same objection with regard to Bitcoin. There's nothing stopping the Bitcoin community from getting together, you know, online or in cyberspace and consensually saying, you know, 21 million is too low. We really ought to have 40 million Bitcoin because that's more practical. So that could happen. It's not happening yet because we're not at that limit. But these are the kind of things when, it, when I say you have to trust the community and trust the evolution, trust the power grid, trust governments. There's a lot of trust of people you don't know that go into Bitcoin, and one of my reservations is, I mean, I'm not a Bitcoin hater. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've read the papers, I've read the papers Roman has, I'm familiar with it. I, I think the technology's cool, the encryption's cool, I like open source. Uh, so I say go for it. I don't own any, I don't recommend it to clients, um, partly because it doesn't have the kind of track record that I look for when I want to allocate wealth. Uh, let me just a add to that briefly. Uh, the, the, um uh, deflation problem, if you consider it a problem, is actually made worse by losses of bitcoins. You can search for losses of bitcoins and read some painful stories about people who had hundreds of thousands of bitcoins and either threw away a computer or or uh, lost their their wallets or something like that. So it's actually worse. But with each one divisible down to 100 million pieces, uh, I don't think that's a problem. And uh, would the community support the changing of the protocol to expand to 40 million or 80 million? Uh, they would. They they would not if it would cheapen the bitcoins they currently own. But if it was if the if it was a problem and people were abandoning bitcoin altogether, then they would choose that to save the value of their coins. But that's a long way away. Uh, yes, sir, David. <laughs> well, if you, uh, if you buy gold at a level and you exchange it for goods and services at a different level, you have to put that on your tax return. Uh, that's not what people do. What they do, <laughs> no, 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 what, what they do is they, I don't mean they don't report on a tax return. What they do is you buy gold for dollars, uh, and then when you, if you need dollars, you sell the gold for dollars and use the dollars to pay your bills. And yeah, that's, that's a taxable gain. You put that on your tax return. So it, I don't think it's any any magic there. It's no different than buying IBM at 100 and selling it at 200. You have a $100 gain, so. Who committed the tax evasion? Um, <coughs> there's probably some tax evasion in, uh, you know, across the board, but I think uh, gold is, uh, you know, you're in and out of the dollar system. It's, uh, let me put it this way. There are very few people evading taxes in gold who don't know what they're doing. I think the problem with Bitcoin is a lot of people just haven't thought about the problem. The, in my experience, the followers of Bitcoin are, libertarians and technophiles, not necessarily economists or traders. And so I, I think in a lot of cases, it's just naivete. They can't put us all in jail. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you think that 
Bitcoin when you're sending it a consumer or a distributor? Um, can you help me with the difference between consumer and producer good? Well, a, that's why I asked you if you think a, a exchange is a consumption to an opportunity cost because a producer good is a, a higher order good used for a final consumption good for the uh, everyday, you know, uh, oh. uh, version good. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, that's a good question. Um, the, the service, I would classify it the same as the, the service of money transmission. Um, so however you would put that. I actually, I, I, I don't know, I, I would love to defer to our Austrian scholars in the room uh, on that question, but I don't know. Uh, you did re remind me of an earlier point, if you allow me to escape from that question. <laughs> uh, uh, you mentioned Menger's definition of money being a good that exists on the market, yeah. and I was very happy to hear that because um, I didn't know that he used those words. Because when Mises describes it, he uses the word physical commodity, so that spoils it right there. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that Menger just said a good that exists on the market because then if you want to do the men mental gymnastics, you can say that it's, uh, it's packaging a service as a money. But I still think this is maybe not a very important game because we're, we're dealing with archaic definitions. More questions? Oh. This is a, this is a tough crowd to take issue with the uh, Austrian tenants, but uh, I, I would suggest that there are things in the world other than producer and consumer goods. Uh, and one of them is the rule of law. Uh, and the rule of law is civilization's alternative to violence. In other words, absent of rule of law, through, through most of history, wealth was created at a very, very slow pace. Uh, a little bit here and there, some from trade, some from you know, mining and, and agriculture, but wealth grew very slowly. The way you got a lot of wealth was, was through violence. You, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, 30 years war, uh, crusades, uh, uh, nightly uh, combat, um, you know, the Norman invasion, you name it, but the way you got wealth, Vikings, raids, the way you got wealth was by stealing it from other people and killing them in the process. Um, it was only really with the Industrial Revolution that we got better at creating wealth as opposed to stealing wealth. But part of that evolution on and off is the rule of law. I would put money, uh, my definition of money would be a contractualism theory rather than Austrian theory or monetarist theory or chartalism, which is the state power of money. Uh, I would advance a contractual theory, which is really a subset of law, and saying that money is part of a rule of law, one of the ways that societies facilitate commerce and wealth creation without violence. And in that regard, Bitcoin is a form of money. Yes, sir. Yeah, everything about Bitcoin is it's code and any any good programmer can go and read all of it so a at this point I will say that there are no secrets in the Bitcoin code there are no back doors um, like it could be that some guy with a, a gigantic brain is gonna figure out how to crack elliptic curve cryptography but this is like that's some serious like you know scholarly work to, to break that kind of cryptography. But even then, the blockchain still exists. We know who owns who own what Bitcoins. So at worst, it's a disruption and they'll switch to a different type of cryptography. But those are, you know, the types of crypto used in Bitcoin, they've been under academic scrutiny for, for decades. Yes, How can somebody um, stop it from being counterfeited, from being recreated? Oh, okay, by, by b counterfeiting, uh, it seems like you're referring to making a Bitcoin 2 that does the same thing in parallel. Those already exist. There are hundreds of, uh, of those. But within the Bitcoin system, nobody has ever sent the same Bitcoin <coughs> twice and had it accepted. Yeah. So that, when, when, we, when I was talking about counterfeiting and, and better uh, verifiability than gold, that's what I meant. Within the ledger that is Bitcoin, Nobody has ever made fraudulent transactions or sent bitcoins they didn't own or anything like that. Other questions? Great, thank you for your attention.
Our next speaker is uh, Craig Drake, a native of, of this country, uh, the Great Britain, as I prefer to call it, rather than the United Kingdom. Craig Drake is a financial analyst covering foreign exchange markets and fundamental economic outlooks with a particular focus on monetary policy. He has written on financial and regulatory issues for a number of newspapers <coughs> and think tanks and worked as a financial writer for uh, work works as a financial writer for the, the City AM newspaper. Craig Drake studied law at the University of Kent and at the University of Rennes in France. I'm told he speaks uh, French better than the average native Frenchman. I don't know about his taste of wine but his political taste would rank above average on both sides of the English Channel. He's also the chief Bolshevik hunter of the anti-Bolshevik League, <laughs> or so he claims. He likes to cover his life with mystery. Perhaps he will someday reveal his true identity. <laughs> Insider trading is the subject of his talk. Its title is Why Insider Trading Can Be Good for Market Outcomes. Provocative enough. I'm looking forward to hearing his arguments. Please welcome Mr. Craig Drake. Um, I, I realize it's the, um, the theme of this conference is supposed to be intellectual minds, but it's not a particularly kind of intellectual argument I want to make. There's no kind of Hayek or, you know, Mises or anything like that. Um, it's a more kind of practical view of the unintended consequences of government action. I mean, I thought I'd look at inside trading laws because they're a great example of what happens when a well-meaning government intervenes in the market. You know, the result of which is regulators pursuing and trying to crack down activities and behavior that would not have occurred or have been any great benefit to those that engaged in them if it was not for the regulation in the first place. It's kind of like the war on drugs. You know, most of the, uh, most of the time and expense and resources taken up cracking down on, on, the, on the drugs trade would not have happened if it wasn't for the government stepping in there. And it's the same with the pursuit of, um, of insider trading, which I don't believe is, uh, carries any particular victims. On the face of it, most of the kind of pursuit against insider trading is in the name of fairness. The idea is to level the playing field and to prevent those privileged few at the top with access to inside knowledge from benefiting from their exalted position, the expense of the great and wash, not privileged that information. Whether you've got a senior manager dumping stock ahead of some bad news, a lawyer benefiting from pending regulatory changes, or a member of our public relations team benefiting ahead of the release of a big new product. The laws surrounding insider trading are difficult to enforce and patchy, which isn't the kind of ideal state of affairs considering how heavily the state can come down on kind of any infractions. You know, you look at kind of somebody in prison at the moment serving 11 years who shouldn't be in prison at all for having been convicted of insider trading. I mean, you look at the, um, the SEC definition of what constitutes an insider, just as an kind of example of just how patchy and how difficult to enforce a lot of its regulation is. Um, the SEC is constantly changing and evolving what it counts as insider trading, but by and large it constitutes any company officer, director or holder of, any, of more than 10% of a company's stock or anybody that those above directly communicate, any that they directly communicate with in relation regarding their company as an insider. It's kind of like tax law, you know, if you're running a small market stall you know, you're, you're, trade, you're kind of trading £10,000 a year on your market stall. The kind of breadth of what constitutes and what the tax man can do means that any, some ta any kind of moment in time, no matter how diligent you are, you're probably breaking some law. You know, every one of us, I imagine, at some point in the year, no matter how careful you are, no matter how good a, an accountant you have, you're probably breaking a law. And the same comes to insider trading. I mean, if you want to see how difficult the thing is to enforce. You know, you want to look at insiders. Go to any building in the city of London, any building with a license to serve alcohol, 
in the city of London and, and listen, listen to conversations until how long it is until somebody opens their mouth and says something they probably shouldn't have done. And that probably constitutes entire trading. So what do you do? Do you extend the scope to include the barmaids in those bars who can listen to this? Do you extend the scope to listen to for the barmaids of the bars that those, the family of those barmaids go to? You know, it's the idea that you can have regulated individuals in this marketing concert. Some people insiders and some people not is unenforceable. But law being difficult to enforce does not in itself mean it shouldn't be pursued. You know, or else I'd be stood here making the argument that rather than abolishing insider trading laws, we should be throwing more money at it. You know, we should be throwing more tax dollars, sterling euros, cracking down this ostensibly pernicious crime. I mean, as a, a Californian court said in 2005, um, corporate insider trading is a manifestation of undue greed amongst the already well-to-do, worthy of legislative intervention, if for no other reason than to send a message of censure on behalf of the American people which I think pretty well sums up the mindset of lots of regulators. The idea that they don't care, there's no concept there of improving outcomes for markets or for anybody. They're simply interested in sending a message of grandstanding rather than trying to improve outcomes, which seems a, a fruitless pursuit. Um, I'd argue that they should be abolished, firstly, because like much government intervention, it creates a very false sense of safety and security. And secondly, it inhibits important mechanisms crucial to price formation and market efficiency. I mean, if you're, if you're buying and selling shares in the markets, whether it's part of a nest egg or you're a basement dweller kind of trading intraday, and you think that the prices you see quoted are not influenced by some kind of insider knowledge, then you deserve to lose money. You know, they all are. And there's nothing you can do about it. Some people know more than you. It's how markets work. But from a slightly more compassionate point of view, it's like so many of these things, a case of the government stepping in to make the world a safer place, you know, and then leaving consumers with a false sense of security because the man from the government has said that everything is okay. So rather than doing your own due diligence and skipping a few steps, you skip a few steps that you would otherwise take. You know, you, I'm sure you've, you've all been to lots of these conferences before. It's like the Food and Drug Administration in the US or the General Medical Council and the MHRA in the UK when they try to regulate moral hazard in medicine and pharmaceuticals sense with disastrous results. You know, you'll see medicine that's, that's, that's been approved by these regulatory authorities, and doctors prescribe them willy-nilly, because they say they have the stamp of approval from the man from the government, and this is okay. And you'll see the same, I mean, look at Bernie Madoff. You know, same people falsely thought that the, that the FD, that the, um, that there was this regulatory over, oversight, and the SEC were breathing down their collar, and it wasn't the case. You know, so many people skipped so much due diligence because this false sense of security, these are not, you know, the kind of less sophisticated investors, they thought there'd been this kind of oversight, and there wasn't. I mean, I'm, I'm relying a lot here on looking at stocks and shares. Um, I think it's more prevalent there, but I think higher up on fixed income FX markets, I think there's more inside trading at a government level, which I'll come to later. It's kind of an interesting side. But, um, so not only does insider trading regulation give the illusion of safety that everything is in the price, but it also gives the illusion of fairness. I said at the beginning, much of the kind of legislation is about making things fair. There's nothing of the sort. It kind of, instead of leveling the playing field and putting the institutional investor on a level, level pegging with the basement, you know, with the kind of the man at home spread betting, it makes information much more expensive. And it's impossible to give a speech about insider trading without making reference to the most famous insider trader of all time, now the boogeyman of avarice and corruption and the nasty side of greed. But Gordon Gecko was no free marketeer. He was no free market buccaneer. The activities that's portrayed are the construct of financial regulation. Without the government being there to create artificial barriers of entry into pools of information, the form of information arbitrage that he carried out and the real-life men that he was based on wouldn't have been possible. You know, this is always portrayed as, you know, here's this man, here's the manifestation of capitalism. He wasn't a capitalist. You know, he was, a, he was on the side of, of the regulator. You know, when, but when Gecko tells Bud Fox that he's drawing under his, under his wing, the most valuable information, the most valuable commodity I know of is, uh, of his, is information. Well, that information would have been quickly and qu efficiently communicated to market participants. If it wasn't for the SEC's controls over its dissemination and the value and it's value inflated for those who prepare to sail a bit closer to the wind. 
which brings us to the next point, which is price formation. When it comes down to it, price is the only kind of certainty that you have to work with. You, know, you, you might have more sophisticated investors who've got access to kind of level T market data, have a clear formation of how price is being formed, and to get maybe better execution. But when it comes down to it, price is what levels you with you know, the kind of institutional investor at um, JP Morgan or your grandfather looking at the kind of the stocks and shares in the back of the newspaper. But, um, but by enforcing insider trading laws, you, you're, you're inhibiting the kind of communication that gives you that price and it keeps information in the hands of the elite. I mean, I mentioned earlier um, um, Raj Rajatranam, who's, I mean, the great example of, of the kind of the brutality by which when they do enforce these laws, they come down. And the, the federal district judge said when he um, pronounced and sentenced him to 11 years in prison, insider trading is an, ins is an assault on the free markets. And the crimes reflect a virus in our business culture that needs to be eradicated, which is a load of crap. You know, price asymmetry exists in every transaction. And it's not a tra it is not a symptom of market failure. You know, this is not an assault on free, you know, insider trading is not an assault on free markets, but rather insider trading laws are an assault on free markets. I don't believe there's, an, there's a credible investor injury story in this. And so I don't see why investor why insider trading should undermine investor confidence in the integrity of the stock markets. So any anger seen by in, over insider trading is mostly envy over the insider's greater access to information. As I said, price asymmetry exists in every transaction. There's always somebody who knows more than you do. But we don't ban car mechanics from buying and selling cars, nor do we ban farmers from buying and selling fruit and veg. And yes, there might be people that get to that information before others and profit from that. But there's no argument for the SEC or the FCA or any other regulatory body from stepping in to prevent that from happening in the name of fairness. I mean, there's some other stupid arguments that say we could limit the flow of investor information from the other side, that you can prevent participants from executing the information for others by implementing trading halts every time a company releases news, but as equally as stupid as a balance their trading and produce just as skewed outcomes. Um, the marketplace is full of buyers and sellers and those with different needs and trading on different time horizons with different objectives and trading on different levels of communication. You can't level that playing field. You can't regulate the world into a fair place. It is impossible to communicate financial information to everyone at the same time. But that mass of human action that constitutes the market is an incredibly efficient market price feedback mechanism and allocated resources. As soon as one person has communicated information to it, it's very rapidly spread through the marketplace. You can drip feed it, you can buy in small lots, but it will, never be it will still be absorbed and reflect reflecting the price. And the fact that somebody can get to the marketplace before others does not hurt anyone. In fact, there are cases where it can ease buying pressure, buying pressure and give everybody access to execution at a better price. I mean, you've seen similar arguments which I always find intellectually interesting around high frequency trading. You see this race to lowest latency and get into the market faster and co-location and try and beat the speed of light to try and um, execute your trades faster. And you see the arguments that it skews markets to drive up volatility. It doesn't. Yeah, it's preposterous. Um, I can remember reading, I think it was Abraham Lincoln, made similar arguments when there's a telegram system which was set up between New York and Philadelphia stock exchanges. And he predicted it would lead to wild levels of speculation. And he made exactly the same arguments that have been currently made about high frequency trading, about telegrams. And that was 150, however long ago. Markets have and always will be thus. I mean, you look at the the boy sat on the cliff with a telescope looking at the trading ships, seeing they're more heavily laden with guds. He had the fastest horse to get to the market anticipating of falling prices. And that's the same as any trading system or algo having a lightning fast trading network. Some people can't get to the market before others, but that doesn't mean that they can't benefit from the subsequent price formation. I mean, the theme of this is about abolishing inside trading laws, but I don't think I'd limit that to top down government enforcement inside trading restrictions. The stupid waste of time, money, and resources, and produce poor outcomes. But that's not to say you can't have private contracts. That's not to say that you can't have shareholders engaging in voluntary agreements and contracts about the ability of board members to buy and sell shares in the firm. That's their prerogative. 
but that, that, but that this kind of voluntary agreement can be pursued through private, through a civil court is not the same as government regulatory oversight and the morally hazard issues that it creates. And I touched earlier on, um, on government involvement in insider trading, which is fascinating from the arguments they produce, they, they kind of put out. These are the people who are enforcing much of this insider trading law, and these are the ones who are putting it on the statute books or pushing it through the courts. Um, I'm sure lots of people have seen the kind of the stats for returns made by politicians on their investment portfolio, portfolios. Um, but there's an interesting study produced last year by the Business and Politics Journal looking at the performance of investment portfolios belonging to members of the US House of Representatives. Um, four university researchers examined 16,000 common stock transactions made by approximately 300 House representatives from 1985 to 2001 and found what they call significant positive abnormal returns with portfolios based on congressional trades beating the market by about 6% annually. See, it's funny how these people make arguments that these laws should be applied to everybody else, but they, they'll make arguments that they shouldn't be applied to them because they're difficult to police, hard to enforce, and don't produce the right outcomes. See, House rules say that um, representatives don't have to divest themselves of common stocks while they assume office. It doesn't prevent them from trading freely while in office. And doesn't require themselves to excuse themselves in votes that could affect their own interests. Which seems like backdoor legalization of insider trading to me, given the kind of sensitive material they have access to. Um, the House Ethics Manual clearly states that all members, officers, and employees are prohibited from improperly using their official positions for personal gain. Members must disclose their holdings annually. However, they should only, it's up to them to, die to judge what is improper and what is proper, and it's odd how seldom that happens. But after all this, you know, but put up with the disparity between patrician and the plebeian, the House of Representatives will not put. In 2012, made much fanfare, they passed the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, or Stock Act for short, which is very clever of them. Um, so the bill was introduced by, by US Senator Joseph Lieberman on January 22, 2012, passed by the Senate by a 96 to 3 vote, and later the House of Representatives passed it by a 417 to 2 vote. You know, Barack Obama signed to law with photographers there, bish bash bosh. However, this April is quietly repealed. And you can imagine this is quite a difficult decision for the esteemed leaders of the US House of Representatives to take to repeal a measure that was damaging their ability to profit from inside information and to line their own pockets. So they debated long and hard. Just how long and hard? Well, according to official congressional records, the deal took 10 seconds in the Senate and 14 seconds in the House. See, there is the argument that because of the difficulty in enforcing inside trading regulations, you should leave them on there. You know, most of it gets through, doesn't harm many people. But, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing people's views on kind of um, open source investment approaches and open source hedge funds, which are kind of interesting development. And I don't see anything that's going to inhibit that kind of creativity. You've seen across information, you've seen Wikipedia, you've seen across so many aspects. You see so many interesting trading approaches. We have open source. And I think it's preposterous that you should have these measures that could inhibit the free exchange of information in the open market on the statute books. So I mean, just to, to round up, you know, it's a top-down inside trading regulation is damaging, counterproductive. It only, damage, it only diverts GDP from productive sectors of the economy into the hands of government insiders, lawyers, and other cracks. I mean, I said there's, there's no issue with forming private contracts and having employment contracts that, that prevent that. And if anybody infringed upon those, they can pursue by, by through civil courts. But that's not the same as having a, a blanket coverage. I don't think there's any, any difference practically from that particular organization that they couldn't just enforce it through private contracts.
until you want to incentivize people to put new information out there to change the price. And you can't incentivize it without having a reward. So the very first person who gets that new information out there into the market is the one who makes profit. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the issue? Yeah, I, I mean, I, say, I said, uh, speaking, it doesn't matter who gets the market first. You know, everybody can ride the coattails. That's what price formation is about. You know, they get to the market first. It's preposterous to exclude the most informed people in the marketplace from communicating that, that information efficiently to the markets. I didn't see why that can't also be covered by non-disclosure agreements. If you want to enforce those, that's, that's your prerogative. Right? What about doctors? Yeah, I can't see anything. That, I can't see anything that couldn't be covered by private contracts, as opposed to top-down government regulation. Any questions? Thanks very much, Craig. <laughs>
con the consumer theory during micro microeconomic classes. In the consumer theory, we get familiar with the so-called indifference curves, uh, maps of preferences, maps of utilities, and the budget lines, which are the constraints upon the consumers in their decisions. And after the uh, consumer theory, we are being taught the production theory. And in the production theory, we are getting familiar with the market structures, with the cost curves, with uh, the concept of revenues, and optimal decisions which are supposed to be based on those uh, various variables. On those variables. And prices, input and output, those things are basically preset on the determined course. So it's like, it's almost like a, a physical model of uh, the solar system in which you just uh, put in the data, you just click it and then things magically happen. Uh, therefore, economic science as, being, as it is being taught at the introductory level, in the beginning during the first year and the second year when uh, students are eager to uh, question it and then after a while they get taught and then uh, forget to ask the questions, what are, what are the problems uh, about those models. Uh, so they uh, get infiltrated by the, by the whole idea how to deal with economic science. And uh, those models are much like, as I said, gravity models or energy models. If you're interested in the history of economic thought, I hi highly recommend to you the works of Philip Mirowski, uh, especially his book called More Heat Than Light. Now his thesis is a bit stretched. He's perhaps even a bit, uh, a little obsessed about it. Uh, he presented in, ver in various books and in various articles. And his general thesis is that uh, economic science was very, very envious of physics. And when it was developed in the second part of 19th century and in the beginning of 20th century, the whole development was based on physical models. And the only thing that, sh that changed in the physical equations were just names for the variables. But the equations themselves, they were actually the same. Uh, for example, uh, the notion of energy was substituted for uh, expenditures, but the equation stayed the same. Uh, and actually, when you look at the works of first neoclassical economists uh, in the 19th century, you will see that. For example, when you read the brilliant uh, British economist, William Stanley Jevons, uh, in the beginning, in the introduction, he says, in economics, we are dealing with quantities. Therefore, if we are dealing with quantities, the best way to deal with quantities is to have a calculus of quantities. Therefore, we need derivative equations. Uh, when you will read Irving Fisher, since we're in the Anglo-Saxon world, I will try to focus on that. We had Jevons as the British economist, and then Irving Fisher, great American economist. Uh, when you read his uh, PhD thesis about mathematical investigations into theory of value, you will see that his descriptions of production theory and of consumption theory are purely based on a priori math. Like anything that happens in there that is being explained, it's, it's not really the real economic process that we see around us. These are just purely a priori models, a priori in the bad sense, in the bad meaning of the term, meaning platonic models, completely detached from reality. They are just some sort of a shadow version of reality and uh, not telling much about it. So what is the problem uh, after this description? You're probably thinking, you probably know uh, who the missing hero is. The missing hero in, in economics, in modern economics, is of course the entrepreneur. Because in, uh, in that description, in, in those neoclassical models, the entrepreneurs are either non-existent or are much like calculators. They are just passive agents of the whole process. Since all the data is already preset, since it's already known, like in Leibniz model, uh, then the solution for the data is just they're given in the assumptions, right? So once you, you deal with the data, you immediately get the solution of what are the optimal decisions. Once you have the information about prices, about preferences, and the model is complete, all you do, you just take this, this deterministic model and try to foresee future conditions. Therefore, there is not much to be discovered. Uh, there is not much to happen uh, that can happen after entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial activities. William Baumol, a very, very good mainstream economist in the 60s, wrote an interesting paper, very short one. Right? The, short, uh, the shortest academic papers are actually the most important ones, remember. Uh, in, in, one, in one of his papers in the early 60s, believe it or not, it was a mainstream uh, journal, 
has written, there is one residual and rather curious role left to the entrepreneur in the neoclassical model. He is the indivisible and non-replicable input that accounts for the U-shaped cost curve of a firm whose production function is linear and homogeneous. How the mighty have fallen, right? Or uh, as the classic would say, this is an ex-entrepreneur. It is not merely stunned, it has ceased to be expired and gone to its maker. This is a late entrepreneur, right? If you know the classic that I'm quoting right now. So uh, the entrepreneur as being non-existent uh, in the mainstream theorizing is the result of this assumption that we already have all the data that we need to know to solve, uh, to get at the solutions of, uh, of the proper allocations. Uh, this is in the uh, microsphere where we deal with uh, completely unempirical models. But things also get interesting uh, when we move to macro models to, for example, explanation how economic development happens. And after Second World War, uh, there was the so-called solo growth model developed. And after the solo growth model, there was huge extension in the literature. The, complex, the model uh, got more complex. Uh, complex. Uh, but what was really interesting in the solo model was that he grouped, uh, in trying to explain the empirical development, he grouped various factors of production into two categories, either labor or capital. And he was trying to empirically explain the economic development. And what was interesting is that there was some strange uh, residual that was important for the most of the development. This residual, the sort of uh, economic neutrino that was not explained, why the growth happens, why there is a difference between, let's say, uh, United States and uh, Argentina. It cannot be explained to reference to those objective factors such as labor force, labor power, and capital force, capital power. We need some sort of other qualitative explanations of what, the, what this neutrino thing, this missing element is. And uh, what uh, I believe and what other uh, economists which are against mainstream theorizing believe is that this, the, this missing element is the entrepreneur. And the question of how uh, uh, various societies developed faster uh, than others is the question how entrepreneurship can be challenged into productive uh, uh, activities rather than non-productive activities. One big exception to uh, this mainstream approach, uh, which, uh, which is very famous, is Joseph Schumpeter, uh, the Austrian economist. Mm. And Joseph Schumpeter could be seen as an enfant terrible of, uh, of Austrian school and neoclassical school. Actually, that's the name from uh, Paul Samuelson. That's how he called them, enfant terrible of the Austrian school and neoclassical school. So one leg as an Austrian thinker and one leg as neoclassical thinker. So for Schumpeter, uh, the entrepreneur is basically, you know what was the first name for the entrepreneur, right? In the 19th century in the linguistic literature. It was not the entrepreneur. It was what? The undertaker, the undertaker right? A wonderful name now, right? And uh, actually, Joseph Schumpeter's theory of entrepreneurship could be termed undertaker's theory of entrepreneurship because for him, the entrepreneur is the undertaker of other entrepreneurs meaning it's the person who is responsible for burying in the ground businesses of other people because he creates something completely new which completely reshapes society and economic systems. Uh, therefore, uh, instead of seeing um, business entrepreneurs as the broad class of entrepreneurs, he, he thought that only part of those, what we call them business entrepreneurs, are true entrepreneurs. Only the most innovative ones, the ones who make non-discrete, uh, non-continuous, huge leaps forward uh, when they develop completely new ways of producing things which reshapes both the economic and social reality. So for him, the, uh, the entrepreneur would be a sort of equilibrium killer, a person who shows up and, and destroys completely uh, what he sees and thinks about new ways of uh, investing things, of developing markets and so forth, and increasing quality of the product. Uh, now, um, and his theory actually, even though quite similar, at least in general nar narration, when you look at the narration, it's similar to the uh, Austrian school theory. His theory is different because uh, the Austrian school would believe that um, the entrepreneurs do not have to actually make all the time revolutionary decisions. The important thing for them is to recognize 
uh, let's say, correct routines and incorrect routines. Uh, because sometimes a good entrepreneurial decision is not to make a leap forward. Sometimes a good entrepreneurial decision is to just leave things as they are, not to, not to make a jump, right? Not to uh, develop new markets, but rather stick with the current ones or with the current ways of producing things. Now, um, and this exactly is missing in the mainstream explanation of what is going on uh, in the entrepreneurial decisions. Uh, the, the very first uh, theorem that we learn during microeconom uh, microeconomic class is the graph. I don't want to get into the details because probably you're not interested anyway, but the, the, the first graph is, is the graph with the marginal revenue curve and the uh, marginal cost curve. Okay, so the curves are drawn and, and when they overlap, when they meet together, that's the optimal decision. And when you're before the point, the entrepreneur passively has to increase production. When you're beyond the point, you have to decrease production. You always have to move, just like a mosquito flying to the light, zzz, right, automatically, you have to move until you reach the point and then you're in, in equilibrium situation, uh, at, at equilibrium point. Mm, so, the, the, the basic problem with this that is that you already have the cost curve. This is fine because cost curve is something we could see when we make an investment decision, right? You, you go into the market and then you notice what the prices are. You can, of course, negotiate them and so forth, but you can treat them as existing, right? But the marginal revenue curve, it's something that is non-existent. You don't see it yet because there is a time, di time dimension. There is a difference between costs right now and future marginal revenues that will be associated with our decisions. Therefore, instead of talking about at the very basic introductory course, instead of talking about the marginal revenue curve existing there, we should rather talk about a sort of blurred cloud existing somewhere there, perhaps. Uh, we don't know how it looks like. We don't know what the probabilities are uh, about various uh, marginal revenue curves appearing in the future. Uh, there aren't actually, actually, there is no numerical probability that could be assigned to those various curves, right? And the whole debate between the, in the entrepreneurs is how the debate, meaning the fight, like uh, economic fight, in the positive sense, is uh, is to get the right, to see the right choice, right? To see the right curve there. And if we uh, taught it in the introductory course, therefore, uh, it would make much more sense, even using the same tools. Now, uh, of course, you can naturally ask the question, isn't it just Austrian talking, right? Uh, one um, interesting side note, in Polish language, Austrian talking is a, uh, is a negative term. When you say in Polish that you're Austrian talking, it basically means you're talking nonsense. It's gibberish, what you're saying, right? So you see, we are less friendly to the Austrians than, than, than the uh, English-speaking uh, countries. So isn't it just the Austrian talking in a sense that, well, of course, everybody will agree that there is some uncertainty. Everybody will agree that the process cannot be known uh, from the outset, right? There is something unpredictable, unpredictable, and neoclassical equations and neoclassical economics is just an approximation, right? So there is no serious neoclassical economist who will tell you, I believe what I teach, and this is exactly how economy works. No, he will say this is just an approximation, you see. So uh, it is useful to explain what would happen under the equilibrium conditions. Now, fair enough, we could accept this, but then we have a debate how useful those approximations can be in actually, for example, design, designing particular economic policies. And I have two uh, negative examples in mind. One, uh, one example is the explanation of development and innovative economy, the so-called innovative economy. Actually, since the entrepreneurship is being treated as a sort of residual, passive residual, and since the whole economic process is being treated as a physical process in which we have various inputs interacting together according to some predetermined proportions, then the, uh, the, uh, the uh, possible economic policy based on this theory would be, well, since the entrepreneurship is the source of economic growth, all you have to do is just subsidize entrepreneurship and innovative economy, right? So all we need to do is just design various, probably EU policies, to supply extra funding and subsidize entrepreneurship, subsidize innovations. So why is that in a mistaken conclusion? Well, because if you assume that you have visible and recognizable production functions, just like either in solo model or in 
various versions of solo and post solo and Romer and, and others, when you just assume you have a function, then obviously, well, you just have to, I don't know, subsidize know how or subsidize this particular on, of investment. And then magically, it's like adding new seeds into the ground and then magically plants will go. That's the same approach to entrepreneurship and economic development. Whereas in reality, the case is that innovations are in a way hidden. They are hi hidden innovations. They cannot be known uh, from the outset, from the outside of the whole process. Because if they were, actually, uh, somebody would already invest in them. Uh, there is an interesting research done in Great Britain uh, by organization called Nesta. Interestingly, public organization. And uh, Nesta uh, is showing that this approach to innovative economy uh, has shortcomings. Uh, because uh, uh, innovations cannot be recognized objectively uh, um, easily before they happen. And uh, their, their research is also about private uh, companies and often uh, when you will focus on private companies, how they, um, how they grow, even bigger companies, you see that they, there is a research development, uh, for example, research development department at the company. But it's not really the case that research development uh, develops something, it develops something and, and um, finds out some new ways of producing things. Actually, quite often innovations happen in other departments and then, only then, when this happens, the research and development already starts working on it, right? So it's not really the case that you can just objectively uh, focus on it and then uh, automatically like discover it, like growing the plant from uh, from the ground, the, the innovation itself. So very often innovations are hidden in nature. And the second example uh, would be uh, the antitrust policy. Uh, again, uh, the whole idea of anti antitrust policy is based on the notion that we can somehow put ourselves uh, ourselves in, you know, in Leibnizian shoes, like put ourselves outside of the process and, for example, determine which prices are correct, which costs are incorrect, when the entrepreneurs are actually colliding and hurting the consumers and when they are innovative, right? Because it is, of course, forbidden according to competition law, to antitrust law, it is forbidden to collide, it is forbidden to, s uh, to fix prices unless is beneficial to the consumers, unless it's going to lead to beneficial results. But how is how are we to decide whether it will lead to some positive innovations or not? And this cannot really be decided before the process happens. And the, uh, the whole idea of antitrust policy is based on this notion that we can have this knowledge before actually the market process happens. In a way, the, I like to name this uh, paradox as a uh, previous fiancé paradox, right? Whenever you're uh, assessing whether the current fiancé is, is a good fiancé, you're always comparing it to some uh, previous fiancé, but you cannot really be sure that the previous one was better, right? It's always subjective how you look at it. The same way uh, the antitrust politician, uh, polit uh, politicians are, are thinking, right? So uh, we see some change happening, right? We are assuming that what is currently right now, uh, the, the economic system, the economic structure is fine, and then suddenly one company is being taken over by the other company. Now, this is suspicious. We have to do something about it, right? It's like the, what was happening previously was better in some way. Uh, okay, so this would be... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, that, that, I'll finish with that. I want to go into much of the details. Uh, but in general, to summarize, the missing heroes in economics are the entrepreneurs. And the consequences of that are actually very, very important. Because when we put the entrepreneurs outside of the picture, uh, in the introductory course, and, uh, and in the microeconomic theory, and in the macroeconomic theory also, we put the entrepreneur aside, we're not really explaining what is going on. Therefore, we cannot really explain why, for example, Western civilization is um, better developed uh, than other civilizations. And also, we will not be capable of explaining why this civilization might fall down if we cannot explain what are the sources of its strengths. So uh, I'll finish here and, and open the question session. Thank you. Do you know the antitrust jokes? Oh, the antitrust joke. I, I, I can give the antitrust joke. Uh, <laughs> 
So the other, yeah, I didn't want to do it here. I, I'd rather prefer doing the session. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 back, I'll be back with the joke soon because I have a question, yeah? I was very surprised that in your whole presentation you didn't mention the role of institutions that they play in <coughs> taking the Austrian premise that people have an incentives then the institutional framework within a society or new institutions, for example, would be the determining factor of the country's world. What is your take on that? Uh, 30 minutes. That's my answer, and I completely agree with your point. Uh, I didn't talk about institutions because I've, uh, I want, I th I, well, I think that institutions are important because uh, in the right institutional framework, the entrepreneurs can do their job. And I would say if we didn't have gifted entrepreneurs, the institutions themselves may not be sufficient for high development. So I would say institutions are and usually in most societies, institutions are very, very important factor, but still they are important factors because they create the framework for gifted entrepreneurs. Uh, if you imagine society with people who have no entrepreneurial skills, even institutions might not work, even if they are correct. That would be my answer. But still, I would agree with you that institution is the big part of the answer why, for example, Western society is developed. Is it? Right, okay. Um, Matthias, you said that in uh, market optimization you can have a sense, a pretty good inference about the cost curve, but the revenue curve is in a cloud because of the X factor, let's call it, of the entrepreneur. <coughs> I agree with that. Uncertainty. But, but isn't, isn't the cost curve in a cloud also as a result of public policy uncertainty? For example, I'll just take the United States. You know, if I, if I want to make a $10 billion, seven year capital commitment to some enterprise today, and I say, well, what are my health care costs? What are my tax costs? What are my regulatory costs? My environmental costs, et cetera. I don't know the answers to any of those. And so I would say the cost curve is in a cloud also. Yeah. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I agree, I agree. That, ex that actually extends the answer because it, uh, gives, uh, it uh, explains that actually often decisions are made in sequences, right? So I make one decision and then another one and then another one. And then of course not only the revenue curve is blurred but also the costs are blurred. But, uh, but uh, taking the mainstream point of view, putting aside just one decision, right? You can think of making decision right now, for example, and, and uh, spending money just right now then you could say that the cost curve is there. But, but in general, yeah, you're right, and this extends the problem because then once we extend the time element, then decisions happen after another decision, and therefore, of course, the, the blur, the cloud should be also for the cost curve too. So would you comment on some economists who you think do a very good job of describing the role of the entrepreneur and uh, integrating that into their theory? Mm -hmm. and who do you like the best? Apart from Austrians, <laughs> uh, I can include Austrians. So now I have to pick one. Not one. A few. A few. Okay. So not to cause controversies. <laughs> Mises, Hayek, Kirchner, and Rothbard. How about that? Okay. And which one do you like the best? Uh, Mises, definitely. Yeah, I think he was the clearest in, in his explanations and, and also the most novel one. But Hayek was close, but he was more unclear in his writings. Yeah. Uh, if, if I might uh, suggest to uh, the, the gentleman who asked that question, uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, I, I, in my opinion, is a great uh, exponent of the function of the entrepreneur. That's true. Yeah, I agree with that too. Puerto de Soto too, right? But but his his name will get even bigger with time. So what are you dating me? <laughs> <You're sad. laughs> well, he still will write more books than <laughs> those uh, economists, right? Of the mainstream economists, are there any that you like on the subject of um, I like Baumol, the one I quoted. Um, Although early Baumol, because after a while he, he was not that good. Um, Peter Drucker doesn't count, right? So yeah, I would pick probably Baumol from, from what I read. Uh, most of those mainstream economists, Baumol will be my favorite. Especially his, his theory of competition. 
uh, the one he developed in the early 80s where, where he explained that the importance for competition is to have potential companies going into the market. Uh, so that was very, in a nutshell, could be a very free market theory, right? Saying that you don't need to have many competitors, you just need to have freedom of entry. And that was his argument, with some exceptions, but you can just uh, twist it a little bit, so uh, to make it more sensible, and, uh, and it would be very, very comparable to Rothbard's theory. Of well, only other mainstream economists make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> other ones? Are there any others? Uh, yeah, it could be you know, um, institutional economists, for example. If you count them as mainstream, they would probably say they are not mainstream, but the mainstream ones... Hmm. Not in the theory of entrepreneurship, so... Exactly. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe in macro theory, some technical details, too. So the joke now, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the joke is, uh, during the communist era, three workers meet in prison because they were sentenced. And, and the, each of them is telling why he was sentenced, what he was sentenced for. And the first one is saying, I was sentenced because I was showing up late for work. So they said, I'm trying to exploit society. The other one is saying, uh, I got caught and, and put in prison because I was coming too early. They thought, I'm a capitalist pig, I want to work hard and earn more money. And the third one is saying, well, I came in on time. I was the one to have a watch, actually. So they thought I'm bourgeoisie because I have a watch, right? <laughs> and then 20 years after that, those three uh, persons are meeting in prison again, but they are entrepreneurs now. And each of them is telling what happened. And the first one is saying, well, I was, uh, I was uh, charging, my prices were too high for my product. So they said, I'm trying to exploit the consumer. The second one is saying, well, uh, I was, my prices were very, very low and they said I'm trying to engage in cutthroat competition to uh, kill everyone in the market and then become an ultimate monopolist. And the third one is saying, well, I, I charge the same prices as every, everyone else is charging and they said I run a cartel, right? <laughs> so that's the antitrust dog, but it's very, very smart joke to, to uh, demonstrate to you what is the exact problem with antitrust policy. You have a paragraph for everyone, right? Right. Thank okay. You very much. Thank you.